Grandiose terms here today. You have declared that Joe Biden was involved and that you have mountains of irrefutable evidence to support it. So let's look at the mountains of irrefutable evidence. You provided the committee with a screenshot of a text message that uh, is between James Gilliard and you, dated May 11th, 2017. You see this? I don't know if you can see it. If you can't see, it's uh, just you and James Gilliard, though, right? You remember this text message, I'm sure. Uh, generally, yes. All right. And in it, Gilliard writes, man, you are right. Let's get the company set up, then tell H and family the high stakes and get Joe involved. And two days later, Mr. Gilliard sent an email to you CCing Rob Walker and Hunter Biden in which he suggested a division of the company and included a proposal of, quote, 10% held by H for the big guy, question mark. You remember that, right? Uh, the infamous e uh, email with the big guy? Yes, yeah. I do. Um, did anyone ever respond to that email? Yes, they did, numerous times. Sorry. Hunter Biden ever, himself excuse me, did. Excuse me, I, you're right. Well, no, did I think that's important because sir, Hunter Biden has claimed that he didn't can you respond to it, and he responded okay. to it. The, I believe, you're just going to filibuster. I reclaim my time that's running out, but I will say, no one responded to the big guy reference for 10. Thank you so for making my what? point. They didn't have to respond right. because then, they all knew the big sir, guy was Joe I Biden. I reclaim my time. Mr. Chairman, please control the witness. I would like to say, I would like to uh, get a little extra time, Mr. Chairman, because I want to read what Mr. Gilliard said to the Wall Street Journal. Quote, I would like to clear up any speculation that former vice president was involved with the 2017 discussions about our potential business structure. I am unaware of any involvement at any time of the former vice president. The activity in question never delivered and project revenue. Nine days later, the agreement without Joe Biden was signed. You and James Gilliard wanted Joe Biden involved, and that is why Hunter Biden dumped you and did the business That's on his own. That's a blatant lie, Mr. Goldman. Back. You know better. The chairman's time's expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Higgins from Louisiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bobulinski, thank you for being here today, and we appreciate the candor of your responses, sir, which is reflective of, of the way you handled yourself in private testimony and deposition. So I thank you for communicating truthfully to the American people today. I'm going to ask you about the China Energy Fund Committee, the CEFC. You familiar with that, sir? I am. Is this a multi-billion dollar company, like a Fortune 500 company at one time? It's even bigger bankrupt? than that. If you go back and look at its financials in 2016 and 17, it was probably one of the five largest com okay. private companies in China. So exactly. So this, this was a this was a, a a major a major operation that had a lot of money, and apparently I'm going to hold up a, a memo here from this is a chart from from the second bank memo, and it shows disbursement of a total of uh, almost $24 million for diamonds. It, so you have, a, you have a major Chinese company spending a lot of money on diamonds, and apparently diamonds were used as a, a means of payment for the Biden family we know that, that, that the Bidens have testified that admitted to having two diamonds. We suspect that there are many, many more, $23 million worth of diamonds. Um, are you familiar with the exchange of, of valuable assets to pay the, the Bidens other than electronic transfers of monies? Are you aware of of uh, payments in diamonds, payment in cash, payment in uh, in board memberships, et cetera. Am I generally aware of it, yes, or was sir. I involved? Yeah, I, I I read Jim Biden's and Hunter Biden's transcript multiple times. Jim Biden in that transcript references two Biden or two diamonds that were given to Hunter Biden. One, he implies, was in 2015 by an individual who he, he couldn't recall his name, but the individual's name is Scott O, who was a surrogate for CFC. And then apparently a second diamond was given at a meeting in Miami, and I really want to set the record clear. I was not at 
that physical meeting. I was in Miami, but I was not at that physical meeting. That's what I told the FBI in my transcript interview. Are you aware, Mr. Bobulinski, of, uh, of a pattern of, of bribery, of bribe payments coming from the China Energy Fund Committee? I appreciate that question. I wish everyone on this committee would read the 1,200 pages of testimony in an eight-day trial in the SDNY where Mr. Goldman used to work while the actual trial was going on that accused numerous executives, ultimately Patrick Ho, of corruption, bribing, leaving shoeboxes exactly. of cash to a so, variety of political figures in Africa. Exactly. So, Mr. Bobulinski, from, from, your, from your perch, within the Biden family operations and their interactions with uh, major businesses in China and the exchange of millions of dollars that are known. We've tracked them through bank rec records, through suspicious activity reports, through emails, through communications that this committee has documented. It's, it's, it's no, it's, there's no debate that millions and millions of dollars flowed into the Biden family's bank accounts but the existence of, of other forms of payment is fascinating because diamonds are untraceable. We really don't know how many diamonds the Bidens received, do we? We don't. And for somebody who's been to mainland China probably 10 plus times, Hong Kong probably 15 plus times, yeah, I had hundreds shift. of people, uh, Congressman, I had hundreds of people working for me in mainland China. At one point, I never got a diamond from I mean, any businessman or woman. So, Mr. Bobulinski, I shift quickly to a text message. Um, are you familiar with this? It begins from a gentleman named James. Generally, yes. Yeah, it says, don't mention Joe being involved. It's only when you're face to face. I know you know that, but they are paranoid. And there's a response saying, okay, they should be paranoid about things. And then there's a response saying, for real. So, what is meant by don't mention Joe being involved? It's only when you're face to face. I know you know that, but they are paranoid. Well, I think it outlines how the Bidens operated, not specifically just with CFC. You have Galanis here testifying and numerous other witnesses that have given you tremendous amount of evidence that outline they, they work to obfuscate it create layers of obstruction. That's the reason why Rob Walker was getting sent millions of dollars instead of Hunter Biden directly. That's the reason why Devin Archer was receiving millions of dollars instead of going to Hunter directly. You guys have a mountain of evidence that stacks high and answers that question on how they obfuscated, they lived in a world of plausible deniability. Thank you, Mr. Bob Alinsky. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield. Chair now recognize Ms. Norton from D.C. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Galanis, thank you for appearing voluntarily for this hearing from Alabama. I understand you are currently serving a 189-month sentence in federal prison, almost 16 years, after being convicted of not one but two, uh, but not one, not two, but three different schemes. The victims of your schemes as the judge who presided over your criminal prosecution noted, included, and here I quote, one of the poorest Native American tribes in the country, as well as pension funds held for the benefit of transit workers, longshoremen, housing authority w workers, and city employees, hardworking people, everyday people among others. The court also noted that you personally benefited from these schemes, and again, I quote, using over $8 million, uh, almost $9 million, for lavish personal expenditures, including home expenses, automobiles, travel, clothing, jewelry, expenses, and meanwhile, investors were left with nothing. But this is not your only encounter with prosecutors. In another case, the Security and Exchange Commission charged you in 2005 with accounting fraud in connection with your investment, your involvement, rather, with Penthouse Magazine. And in 2010, 
you were convicted of attempted tax evasion and were sentenced to five years probation in order to pay nearly two million dollars in restitution. In imposing your uh, prison sentence, the judge noted that you are, and here I quote, an extremely, extremely talented man, extremely gifted in his interpersonal skills, uncommonly so. He is very persuasive uh, as an individual, and those were the tools in his tool bag uh, of the fraud he committed and the people he ensnared, his intelligence, his interpersonal skills, his charm, if you will. And this is something that is not unseen in people who are commonly referred to as con artists. Another judge who presided over your case referred to you as, quote, a skillful con artist. A skillful con artist, that is who my Republican colleagues are relying on to carry their water in this sham impeachment inquiry after their last star witness, the author of the infam infamous FBI Form 1023, was indicted for lying and outed as a likely Republican agent. It is time we put and into this pathetic and desperate inquiry, I yield my remaining time to uh, Ranking Member Raskin. Ms. Norton, thank you very much. Uh, so for more than a year now, we've heard <clears throat> innuendo, rumors, propaganda, big lies, but no facts, no evidence that could reasonably support the finding of impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors against President Biden. In our first real impeachment hearing, uh, the majority invited several expert witnesses who came together and their witnesses agreed with that, that there was nothing that remotely approached the level of proof needed to support a finding of high crimes and misdemeanors that one would impeach a president for. And now we come back again today and the majority has two witnesses, one, the designated con man as determined by two different federal courts not without talent, but someone who deploys his talent towards the purposes of exploiting Native American Indian tribes, pensioners, and other innocent investors. And then Mr. Bobolinsky, who offers uh, a lot of rhetoric and a lot of hot air, but absolutely no facts that could indict the President of the United States for high crimes and misdemeanors, impeachable offenses against the Republic, the kinds of offenses which James Madison said are great attacks on the Republic itself, great affronts to our Republican form of government. And nobody on their side can even tell us what is the impeachable high crime and misdemeanor, which suggests that they are moving in the direction of criminal referrals and they should start by looking at their own witnesses. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to remind the, the ranking member and Ms. Norton, the witness, uh, Mr. Galanis, was partners with Hunter Biden. That's why he's here. We have their partners. You could have invited partners, but you invited uh, this guy. Yeah, Donald Trump's partner, Mr. Uh, Parnas, who oh, was working with Donald, Donald Trump, Trump and Rudy Giuliani. Rudy, Rudy Giuliani's All right. partner. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Grofman. Yeah, we got a variety of things I'd like to go through. But first, uh, Mr. Lynch complained about Mr. Galanis testifying from prison. So I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the Department of Justice's own press release announcing the, the sentencing of the Democrats' witness, Leb Parnas, to 20 months in prison for, among other things, making false statements. Without objection on Donald Trump's partner. You're, you're Thank you. Now, now, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, we, we had originally hoped uh, that we'd see a few more witnesses to here today. They're not here, but I would like to run a brief tape because I showed up today hoping I'd be ask, asking these witnesses a little bit more about this tape. Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, there's some mystery or some people feel it's still ambiguous as to how this prosecutor was fired in Ukraine, and I wonder if this tape could do a little bit more to shed light on why that prosecutor was fired and why we want Hunter Biden and Mr. Archer here today. Uh, and uh, so I got Ukraine. and. Uh, um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 
12, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to the press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of a bitch! <laughs> Got fired, and they put in place someone. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to put that up there because I do eventually want further further efforts made to get Hunter Biden or, or Mr. Archer here because we have Joe Biden himself bragging that they got rid of a, uh, uh, a prosecutor who would have provided his uh, son's business dealings mm -hmm. with uh, a little bit um, more, more tough uh, going or more observation. I'll put it that way. Now, Mr. Bobolinsky, in, in previous interviews, uh, you tra in previous interviews with this committee, you said that Joe Biden not only knew about the family's business dealings, but enabled them and participated in them. You went so far as to say, it's clear to me that Joe Biden was the brand sold by the Biden, by the Biden family. Could you elaborate a little bit why you felt that way again? Correct. Um, that's one of the challenging things I've had to deal with over the last four years with the focus of just simply telling the truth. The obfuscation around these facts are just beyond, <clears throat> beyond insane. So I'll use a meeting at the Four Seasons Hotel in Washington, D.C. that I was not at, but apparently eight to ten Chinese executives of CFC were at with Chairman Yi and Director Zhang. Director Zhang I uh, interacted with extensively. And James Gillier was in that room, Rob Walker, Hunter Biden was in that room. And my understanding, based on Rob Walker's testimony, is that Joe Biden walked into that room, sat down, shook hands with people, and spent five or ten minutes talking about his family, I guess. I was not in the room. People have tried to obfuscate that meeting, like Joe Biden was walking in there to ask about the weather, and Rob Walker said that the Chinese didn't even know that Joe Biden was the former vice president of the United States, which is beyond absurd. The power that those 10 Chinese individuals had to go back to mainland China and say that they were in a room with Joe Biden is the value of what they were giving. Okay. Uh, you stated that the, the, Bi the Biden family concocted a scheme to give Joe plausible deniability. Could you, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well. I would just point to all the different text messages and communications. They call him the big guy. Um, I wasn't involved with Mr. Galanis or, or Mr. Archer, but they're giving you numerous data points. Um, there was obfuscation. They didn't use his name. They used the big guy. You weren't supposed to talk about it. It was just, uh, okay. you know. And, and, and you personally met with, with the vice president. I did twice. Okay. And it was obvious that he say anything that indicates that you wanted him to help his son, that sort of thing. Well, well, he thanked me for helping his son and his brother and asked me to keep an eye on them as I walked him out to his car after he gave his speech uh, on the second meeting of the uh, Milken Conference. Okay, just one other follow-up, and this is kind of maybe a vague question, but I'd like to know it. One of the things that disturbs me about that is the interaction with the Chinese, or that's what we're dealing with today, but obviously other countries as well, that apparently in their own mind, the way you deal with the United States is the way you deal with a say, a corrupt city council or something like that. In other words, you know, you give them money and you get what you want. Do you want to comment on that, or did you hear any stories about that, or was it, did you hear stories that they were surprised how easy it was to buy the U.S. government? Well, I think and, that and it was... Sounds exciting, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, answer I, the question, but please feel free to answer the question. Yeah, I think, the C, I think CFC, and it, there's tremendous evidence, believed that they were bribing the Biden family, and they were doing it via Hunter Biden. It's, it's kind of shameful. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Chair, now recognize Mr. Khanna for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Parnas, can you tell me about your meetings with uh, Dmitry Firtash and why uh, you believe the Trump campaign used his services? 
Yes, uh, well, I was sent to meet with Dmitry Firtish because Dmitry Firtish uh, had uh, resources. He, he's an oligarch that was in Vienna waiting to be extradited to the United States. But he was very close with uh, Vladimir Putin, Ukraine, and uh, lots of uh, characters in that part of the world. And our, my objective at the time was to have him help us lean on Mykola Zlachevsky and get uh, dirt on the Bidens. And what type of dirt were you trying to get? Uh, we were searching for Hunter's uh, hard drive that we were told was out there. We were searching for bank records uh, to validate certain bank records that was given to me, Hunter's personal bank records uh, that was given to me by John Solomon that he said he got from the FBI uh, to validate certain payments that were going uh, for car purchases. But the objective was to try to find a link from uh, any of the payments that would go into uh, Joe Biden's account. And who told you to get this dirt? Uh, well, who told me? Rudy Giuliani. Uh, anyone else that you remember? Uh, John Solomon. Uh, I mean, everybody that was part of the team. I mean, Did Bill Barr was... know that you were involved in getting this dirt? Absolutely. Bill, was, Bill Barr was notified of our investigation from the day he took office. Did you ever have a conversation with Bill Barr of being lenient towards Dimitri uh, in his role, in Bill Barr's role as Attorney General? I personally did not, but I w was witness to uh, Victoria Tunzing and Jody Genova having a conversation with Bill Barr about Dimitri Firtish. What did they say to Bill Barr? Uh, basically, they were telling him that the um, charges were false and that he needs to drop the charges and basically end the case. And why did they tell him to drop the charges on this Russian oligarch? Because Dimitri Firtish was going to help us um, getting dirt on the Bidens or whatever else the Trump campaign needed. So my understanding is you have the Trump campaign telling you to talk to a Russian oligarch to get dirt on the president of the United States for political reasons, and then someone from the Trump campaign is talking to the attorney general to drop the charges because this foreign national is helping get dirt on a political candidate? Absolutely. Did Bill Barr indicate any willingness to drop the charges? After a meeting that uh, Victoria Tunzing and uh, Joe DiGenova had with DOJ, uh, they came back and informed me that we're going to Vienna because to tell Dimitri Firtish everything's going to be okay. Do you know if Bill Barr uh, in any way told you to say that? I was not privy to in that meeting, no. Do you have any uh, evidence that Bill Barr would have uh, indicated uh, to signal to, to Dimitri to, that the charges would be dropped? only from conversations from Rudy Giuliani or Victoria Tunzing. And what did they say about what Bill Barr said? They basically told me that this would be taken care of as long as Firtish played ball, and that's the message they relayed to me to tell Firtish. And they said that Bill Barr was uh, conveying that to them directly? Uh, yes, after meetings. There were several meetings. One, there was a private meeting at, uh, where Rudy Giuliani went and bumped into actually Bill Barr at the Trump International Hotel, and he used that as a moment to take him aside, speak to him. And then there were certain official meetings through official channels where Victoria Tunzing met with him. So, yes. Do you know anything, if, if anything was done with the charges? Uh, till this day, Dimitri Firtish is not here. Do you believe that Bill Barr should be investigated for uh, his conduct in potentially dropping these charges? I absolutely believe that, but not only that, I believe Bill Barr should be investigated into the cover-up and trying to silence me to get the truth out of what really happened in Ukraine. And explain the cover-up and what you believe he should be investigated with your last minute. Uh, it was, my arrest was set up strictly to shut me up, to seal my documents, take away all my information, and turn me into a crazy man that had no way to prove what was going on. Uh, but the real story was Bill Barr was trying to save Donald Trump from impeachment and use me as a scapegoat. What he didn't realize was Donald Trump was not going to stop and was continue doing what he wanted to do. And that's why it blew up in Bill Barr's face. He also hired a special uh, counsel at the time, Brady, to look into Ukraine. When we tried to reach out with my attorney to uh, special counsel Brady, he never returned our phone call. Nobody wanted to hear anything I had to say that had to do with Ukraine, Donald Trump, or Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Chairman. Wait, with the gentleman, you'll... Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parnas, I just want to say you have stuck to the facts today. We don't hear bombast and rhetoric from you, but you're telling a true story and you've conducted yourself with great purpose and great dignity. And I know your son is here with you today and I hope he and the rest of your family are proud of what you're doing for America. Yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Donalds from Florida for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's been an interesting hearing so far. Let's actually get to the actual paper trail of money flow um, from the CEFC into the bank account for President Joe Biden. And I want to start with a text message, July 31, WhatsApp text message between uh, Hunter Biden and one chairman, uh, one Mr. Zhao. Um, real quick, uh, Mr. Bobolinsky, who is Mr. Zhao? Um, Congressman Donalds, I'd just actually uh, like to spend 20 seconds. If you noticed, uh, Congressman Khanna scurried out of here very quickly. And I'm actually disgusted as I sit here that he didn't address me based on the fact that I'm sitting here in front of the world trying to testify to the truth. In October 2020, I have messages I'm willing to produce to both the Democrats and the Republicans that Ro Khanna sent to me saying, you have never, you've always demonstrated to me that you're nothing but an honest with the highest integrity individual. And I was begging for him to go on CNN and tell the world in October 2020. I have extensive emails with Congressman Ro Khanna in 2021 and 2022 where I begged him and his staff to sit down with me and look at my BlackBerry phones that the Democrats are so focused on, to hire forensics experts and go through all of the factual information I had. So the fact that he did not even address me and then scurried out of here is disgusting to me. All right. Sorry, Mr. Donalds. I'll answer your question now. All right, so we're going to have to come off of that because now we're at 3 minutes, 30 seconds. Yep. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, for the record, I want to submit into the record two different WhatsApp text messages, one July 31 between Hunter Biden and Chairman Z and Mr. Zhao of CEFC, which stipulates that Hunter Biden wants to be able to move on from and get the, get the uh, contract resolved, get the deal resolved, and that Mr. Zhao re responds and says, yes, the CE CEFC is willing to cooperate with the family. On August 31, there is another Another inf there's another exchange this time, August 3rd, excuse me, August 3rd, 2017, between Hunter Biden and uh, Mr. Ganway Dong. And in this, in this uh, message, they're talking about the stipulations of the arrangement between the Biden family and CEFC. I want to submit both WhatsApp text messages for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection to order. Okay, now to the money flow, because this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. On August 3rd, they actually stipulate through WhatsApp text, text messages the exact stipulations of the deal. On August 4th, $100,000 is wired into Owasco PC from CEFC infrastructure. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record a, a, a portion of the bank statement for the time period August 3rd of 2017 to August 31, 2017, stipulating $100,000 going from CEFC into the bank account of Hunter Biden through Owasco PC. Without objection, so ordered. On August 8th, Four days later, $5 million is then transferred from the Northern International Capital account of $5 million to Hudson West III. Hudson West III is a bank account controlled by Hunter Biden and Mr. Gon Wang, a.k.a. Kevin Dong, who was a CEFC associate. That money comes from a Northern International Capital a bank account, a bank account that is tied to the CCP. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record the bank statement demonstrating that transfer. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, moving on. On August 8th, the same time period, there is a wire transfer of $400,000 to Owasco PC from the, How the, the Hudson West the third bank account. That $400,000, Mr. Chairman, I have the transfer records in the bank accounts from the August time period. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Now, here's where the fun stuff comes in, everybody, and I got a minute to do it, so we're going to get this done. On August 14th, there is $150,000 that is transferred from Owasco PC, which is controlled by Hunter Biden, to Lion Hall Group, which is controlled by James Biden. I have the records here, Mr. Chairman, of the $150,000 that has gone to Lion Hall Group from Owasco PC. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, to ordered. On August 28th, and I believe we have a screenshot for everybody in the room. On August 28th, Mr. Chairman, we have the withdrawal ticket from Lion Hall Group that is signed by Sarah Biden, who is the wife of Jim Biden, for $50,000 to withdraw from Lion Hall Group. I want to submit that withdrawal receipt for the record. Without objection, to ordered. On September 3rd, on August 28th, actually, Mr. Chairman, we have the deposit reference into Sarah Jones Biden's account on the same day she withdrew it from Lion Hall. I want to submit Without that. Without objection, to ordered. Last document. 
On September 3rd, 2007, from Sarah Biden's own personal account, there is a check that is written to, to Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., the president of the United States today, for $40,000, signed loan repayment, a loan repayment, by the way, that Joe Biden's own personal accountant, Mr. Eric Schwerin, has no record for. I want to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection to order. To the members of the committee, it is clear that the source of this money came from CEFC, and that CEFC is a company that is directly linked to the CCP and, and uh, actually the chairman of the CCP, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, Chairman Xi Jinping. With that, I yield. Very good. M Mr. Chairman, I've got a UC request, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, first, uh, White House for sale, the staff report of the minority side, uh, which details the CEFC's uh, business interactions with Donald Trump. They own a $5.5 million dollar uh, unit in w Trump World Tower and others, and then the, uh, the Department of Justice press release announcing the sentencing of Jason Galanis in federal court to a term of 189 months in prison, ordering him to pay restitution of more than $80 million for three criminal fraud conspiracies against a Native American tribe, pension funds, and other investors. Without objection to order. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Bafume for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm sitting here and um, imagining what I would be thinking if I were not here, but rather somewhere around the country watching the Congress of the United States, and in this case, this committee, for 15 months hold these hearings on Hunter Biden and come up with not one impeachable offense in all that time. 15 months over 10,000 documents and more, as you can see today, as a result of that. This is a do-nothing Congress, and we should be doing the jobs that we were sent here to do, which not to have investigation hearing after investigation hearing over and over and over again, and then run to our favorite TV outlet to give interviews afterwards. We were sent here to get a job done. Taxpayers are looking at all of us. Meanwhile, Americans, black, white, Asian, Latino, Native American, and their families are wondering what the hell is going on. Do, is this another investigation hearing in this 15 months that has yielded nothing at all? It's the do-nothing Congress. You thought Harry Truman said it in 1948. Anybody can say it today. Look at what we've done in 15 months. Virtually nothing, nothing at all. Senior citizens sit in their homes and watch C-SPAN or some other outlet carry this. Some of them are sitting in nursing homes, all of them worried about losing their Social Security. They're on fixed incomes, and they expect the Congress to use its time and its energy to deal with things that affect them directly. Students are defaulting on loans to colleges all over the country, and no one wants to talk about that. Health care is inadequate in most places in this country. And diseases are ravaging our communities, and people assume that at some point the Congress will deal with that. And so whether it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, diabetes, HIV, stroke, the disparities in the health system say, please, please give us a little bit of your time also when you're not dealing with Hunter Biden and when you can't prove that he's done anything wrong. Crime is out of control white collar as well as black collar. And assault weapons are still being used every day to shoot and kill innocent children and Americans. And we're sitting up here talking about something that we've talked about for 15 months with no substantial evidence. Can't get humanitarian aid to Palestine. Can't get military aid to the Ukraine. Children are looking and wondering what the hell is going on. Is that what politics are about? So we, we are doing a disservice. I, wanna, I know I'm supposed to be asking questions, and Mr. Parnas, I may have one or two for you, but I am so outraged at a do-nothing Congress just pointing the finger, pointing the finger over and over again, and people are hurting, looking for real help. Can't deal with immigration, because Donald Trump calls up and kills the immigration bill, and yet people say that's the major issue, is it? I haven't seen the sort of attention that we thought we were putting to that or anything else. And so this particular hearing 
will probably be followed by another hearing and another hearing and another hearing until this Congress expires in January of next year. And we haven't done a damn thing to move the ball forward, except make accusations. Life is too short. Now, maybe some of you have a guarantee you're going to be around forever, but I don't. I came to this body first in 1987. I worked under Ronald Reagan and the first Bush and Bill Clinton and Donald Trump and now Joe Biden. This Congress is not doing anything. It's not like the previous Congresses, trust me. That's why people have such a low esteem of those of us who say, well, I'm Congressman so-and-so. People on the street don't buy that. They don't see the action. So I'm done. I know I've exhausted my time. Mr. Parnas, a couple quick questions, and I'll, I'll let you go. Is it your understanding that Rudy Giuliani worked for an individual identified by the Trump administration as a Russian agent? Yes. Do you know what these Russian line actors were trying to do quickly? Push a conspiracy theory about the Bidens. Did you know that, did you warn Rudy Giuliani? Yes, I did. And what was his response succinctly? He told me that he, I mean, he agreed with me, but then proceeded to work with these people behind my back. And these people have been identified as Russian agents. Yes, sir. And we've got a meeting here of Mr. Giuliani with one of those. I'm just, uh, I'm disgusted, as most people are, about this process. And the only way we get to a point where we get things done is that we learn to talk to one another across the aisle without having another conspiracy theory after another one after another one. You don't buy trust that way. You buy contempt. I yield back. Chair recognizes Lisa McLean for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start off by saying I think most Americans are taught at a very young age that you are who you surround yourself with. I think keep that in a premise as I sat here the, and listened to everyone talk about how Hunter Biden is just this golden boy. I mean, are we really supposed to believe that Hunter Biden is the golden boy? His associates, such as Jason Galanis and Devin Archer, are felons convicted of fraud, yet he is the golden child. I want to talk about examples of Biden's influence peddling scheme. This time, it was Romania. It follows the same general pattern as we have seen with other countries like China, Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Here's the pattern. It's really simple. A corrupt foreign oligarch needs access to the U.S. government. Hunter Biden sells influence to the U.S. government. The oligarchs pay up. So let's just take a deeper dive into this Romanian scheme. Mr. Bobulinski, who is Gabriel Popovich? Gabriel Popovich is a businessman from Romania, probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars, I'd envision. Okay. Is it true that Gabriel Popovich faced corruption charges in, in Romania in 2015? It is. Thank you. And when you were in Europe with the Bidens to close on that CEFC deal with the Chinese, you separately negotiated with Popovich to get a 17th payment. Is that also correct? I did. Okay. But Popovich did not want to pay him. Is that correct? Correct. You're talking about a 17th payment that would go to Rob Walker and then Rob Walker would distribute to Hunter Biden. That is correct. And is it because Hunter Biden had failed in the work he was engaged by Popovich to do, which was to get the corruption charges dismissed by the Romanian authorities? Isn't that correct? Well, it's two things, that they had failed to do that, but also that Joe Biden had left the White House at that point. Okay, so there's a dot. So I get 16 payments while Joe Biden's in the White House. Correct. But after Joe Biden leaves the White House, coincidentally, the payments stop. Correct. Okay. Just want to make sure that we can connect the dots very simply. But obviously it wasn't a coincidence. <laughs> right. I'm not much more for, much for coincidences, which neither are the American people. But, Mr. Bobulinski, what do you think Popovich wanted Hunter Biden to do? I don't have to think because Gabriel told me personally he expected and didn't want the details. He expected Hunter Biden 
Rob Walker and James Gillier um, to do whatever was necessary to impact his case in Romania. But how, how do you know that? Uh, because Gabriel Povich told me that. From his mouth? Yes. Oh, okay, so there's another dot that we can connect. Would that be a conspiracy theory? That's not a conspiracy theory. Okay, thank you. I would encourage you to interview Gabriel Popovich. Thank you. Lastly, after claiming he wanted a public hearing, Hunter Biden decided to skip today. Why do you think he skipped the hearing today? Is that a rhetorical or a serious? <laughs> well, I don't think he wanted to sit next to me because obviously um, I've emphatically stated he perjured himself in his transcribed interview with, uh, with the committee, as did his uncle, Jim Biden, and for every fact he claims or wants to say I was high on drugs or obfuscate, I can show a document, a text message, a recording that is cross, you know, confirmed that uh, he's lying. Well, let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story, right? Here are the facts. Highly disappointing that he's not here, though. <laughs> I would agree. I would agree. Um, here are the facts. Hunter Biden was engaged by a foreign principal, Gabriel Popovich. It is well known that Hunter Biden met with the ambassador to Romania, Hans Klem, in November of 2015. Hunter Biden was not registered under FARA. He stopped getting paid as soon as a f his father leaves office until you got Popovich to send Hunter Biden one more payment. Seriously, what services was Hunter Biden providing to the Romanian oligarchs for millions of dollars? We've yet to hear it. As far as the committee knows, Hunter Biden was never registered under the Foreign Agents uh, Registration Act. If the Department of Justice applied the same standards it did in the Paul Manafort case, Hunter would be in more trouble than he is already in. Mr. Chairman, there are real FARA issues here that we need to continue to look at. And with that, I thank you for being here, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Thank you. Good job. Chair now recognizes Ms. Ocasio-Cortez from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Bobulinski, I, I heard your opening statement. It's submitted to the record, part of our proceedings. I have a quick question, simple. Is it your testimony today that you personally witnessed President Joe Biden commit a crime? I believe the fact that he was sitting with me while I was putting together a business deal. Did you deal, witness the but, president commit it, it, a crime? Is it your testimony today? Yes. And what crime do you uh, have you witnessed? How much time do I have to go through it? It is simple. You name the crime. Uh, Did you watch him steal something? Cor corruption statutes, it, RICO and conspiracy. What is it? What is, are, uh, what is the crime, sir? You, you, Specifically, you, just, wait, you keep up. You asked me to answer the question. I answered the question. No, Rico, you're obviously not familiar with corruption. Excuse statute. me, sir. Excuse Ara. me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Rico is not a crime. It is a category. What I is don't know. the, it's the category of crimes that you're then charged? You under have charges. A long hundred. You have charges. Statute. Yeah. Sir, please you want me to name, name the exact statute sir, under RICO. Yes. I'll, well, it's funny in this committee room. Everyone's not here. There's over eight. All right, sir. I reclaim my lawyers time. Lawyers that I went to law school. Time. I I'll reclaim leave it my up time. To you guys. Okay, to thank you, the sir. I reclaim my time. RICO. Clearly, what we are seeing here today is a continuation of the 15-month saga of the Republican majority lost in the desert. Impeachment 101. The majority party or whomever is raising impeachment must accuse the president of a high crime, a specific high crime or misdemeanor. I would like to submit to the record HRES 918, the House resolution to open this impeachment inquiry. Without objection to order. This resolution does not outline a high crime or misdemeanor. It's not here. Now, when we compare the chairman's opening from his previous opening, he's talking about Ukraine and Burisma and all of this. It is this entire inquiry is based on a blockbuster piece of information that was in a classified skiff room. 
And inside that room was a document alleging President Biden directly of a $10 million bribery scheme, a $10 million bribery scheme, extremely serious. What happened? What happened a month ago, Mr. Chairman? That document, the FBI arrested the person who offered those allegations for falsifying the, his testimony at, to the FBI. This entire impeachment inquiry is based on an, on an actual, provable individual who has lied. Now, responsible leadership would withdraw an inquiry based on that. Withdraw it. Instead, what we are seeing is that this committee was warned about the falsehoods of these allegations long before that, warned by Trump's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and yet they proceeded anyway. The chairman proceeded anyway. This committee was warned by Rudy Giuliani associate right here, Lev Parnas, after that document about the falsehoods of this. Then held hearings where your own expert witnesses said that there was no grounds for impeachment and you proceeded anyway. And finally, as if none of this was enough, the FBI arrested the individual who was the source of the entire, to quote the chairman, heart of the matter to launch this impeachment inquiry and proceeded anyway. At this point, the story is not the fact that the basis of this impeachment inquiry is wrong. The story is why it's proceeding anyway. Why is this committee proceeding based on false charges? And if there, and by the way, no charges. I have yet to hear in the chairman's opening the allegation that they are specifically charging the president of the United States with. I'm hearing about Biden family. I'm hearing about this and that. I am not hearing the specific allegation by this committee. What is it? It's not here. And that is the problem. The story is when this committee knew that they were working with falsified evidence. That's the story. And with that, I yield back. Ch Gentlelady yields back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Mace from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On March 1st, 2024, Joe Biden stated he did not interact with Hunter or Jim Biden business associates. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into a record New York Post article. Biden insists he did not interact with his Without objection to order. We're going to go fast here. I have strictly yes or no questions. On that note, the New York Post article, Joe Biden also said, read the record of every single witness. So I did. I first read Devin Archer's deposition, and he interacted with Joe Biden. Then I read the transcripts of Wab Walker, Eric Schwerin, George Burgess, Kevin Morris, Tony Bobulinski, and Jason Galanis. And every single one of them interacted with Joe Biden. And that's just the people we interviewed. Mr. Galanis, my first questions are for you. Did Hunter Biden call Joe Biden with Elaine <laughs> Batarina on the line on May 4th, 2014, yes or no? Yes. In that call, did Hunter Biden state on this call with Joe Biden that everything is good and we are moving forward? Yes, he did. Okay. On the same call, did Joe Biden in the call was saying, okay, then you be good to my boy? Yes, he said that as well. Okay. Did Baderino, Baderina agree to put $20 million into one of Hunter Biden's business projects days later after this phone call? Yes. Okay. Did Hunter Biden ever take a call from Joe Biden while at the Peninsula Bar in New York? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Did Hunter Biden ever take a call from Joe Biden while at the Peninsula Bar in New York? Yes, he did. Did this during this call, did Hunter Biden update Joe Biden on progress in a landing a business partnership with Harvest Fund Management? Yes. Okay. Was Harvest a three hundred billion dollar Chinese financial services company closely tied to the Chinese Communist Party? Yes, it was. Okay, is Hunter and Biden involved was is Hunter Biden involved with Harvest? Uh, Hunter Biden is involved in Harvest in two ways, through BHR, which is a fund Yes or no, that, uh, was, Hunter Biden, was Hunter eight. Biden involved with Harvest, yes or no? Yes. Okay, as part of the Extensive deal... Extensive emails to that effect. As also. part of the deal, did Hunter Biden want the company to reserve a board seat for Joe Biden? Yes. Okay, did, did Henry Zhao, a Chinese businessman, want assurances Joe Biden would join the board, yes or no? 
Yes, he did. Okay, did he Hunter Biden that in, in, in emails as well? Okay, thank you. Did Hunter, Biden, did Hunter Biden draft an email stating, "Please also remind Henry Zhao of our conversation about a board seat for a certain relation of mine." Mm -hmm. Devin and I golfed with that relation earlier this week, and we discussed this very idea again. And as always, he remains very, very keen on the opportunity. Um, here is a photo of uh, Joe Biden and Devin Archer and Hunter Biden golfing days before the alleged email draft. Do you believe a certain relation of mine refers to Joe Biden? No, I don't think there's any question. It was based on first-hand conversations with Devin Archer, who, who was okay. at, in that picture and at that golf meeting. Did, yes. you ever, did you ever meet with Devin Archer where Hunter took calls from his father? Yes. Okay. During one of these phone calls, and Hunter Biden tell Joe Biden that he and Henry Zhao needed help getting, quote, getting across the finish line. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Mr. Bobolinsky, do you recall receiving an email that floated the possibility of giving 10 percent ownership of Sino Hawk to Joe Biden through Hunter Biden? Yes. Okay. My questions, my last questions are for both of you very quickly. Um, Mr. Bobolinsky and Mr. Galanis, you both stated you were told not to use Joe Biden's name in communications, correct, Mr. Bobolinsky? Correct. Mr. Galanis? Yes. Okay. Did Joe Biden participate in phone conversations and meetings with Hunter Biden, his business associates, and foreign interests? Yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? He clearly did. He okay, Mr. Question. Galanis, yes or no? Yes. Okay. In Hunter Biden's deposition, he said he did not involve his father in his business. Did Hunter Biden lie under oath? Yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Uh, if that's what he said, yes, I would okay. be untrue. Is Joe Biden lying when he says he did not interact with Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, their business partners, or forward interests? Yes or no? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Yes. All right. In a debate on October 22, 2020, Joe Biden denied Hunter Biden made money from China. Then Hunter Biden, his business associates, and foreign interests include money from Chinese businesses, business partners, and or interests. Yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? I'm sorry. Did, did uh, the... Ch did, did the Hunter Biden family Biden make money? money from Chinese Correct. business interests? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Did Hunter Biden money receive from money from Chinese business interests? Yes or no? Uh, yes, he was. Okay, thank yes, you. he had economic interests and yes. All right, Joe Biden yes, has Biden. repeatedly claimed that he was not involved in, in Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, or any other Biden family business deals. Today, our witnesses have proved otherwise. Today, we've established Joe Biden lied about interacting with Hunter Biden's business associates. It is my belief Joe Biden is the closer for Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, and their business associates and foreign interests. Good luck to the left proving otherwise. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chair now recognize Ms. Porter from California. The title of this hearing is Influence Peddling, Examining Joe Biden's abuse of public office. Look, the impeachment inquiry is dead. If it was on life support, my colleague Ocasio-Cortez just killed it. There is no allegation of a specific crime. President Biden didn't do anything wrong. There's zero evidence of that. And still, both Democrats and Republicans and the media treat these hearings like the Super Bowl. But no one ever wins, and Americans always lose. So I've got a fresh direction for this hearing. All we have to do is cross off the part after the colon. colon. There, just influence peddling. We should have a policy discussion about how to stop government officials from using their positions to get money or favors. Now that is a real hearing, one that nearly every American, regardless of party, wants us to hold. We could start by talking about how senior executive branch officials can leave public service, wait just one year, and then legally become lobbyists for big corporations, scoring their new employers profitable government contracts and favorable regulations. They can even be paid by the big corporations during that short one year while they are waiting to become lobbyists as a down payment for their future ability to peddle influence. That's wrong. For the panel of witnesses, by show of hands, as, as um, Americans, would our witnesses support extending this one-year waiting period to at least two years? No, I would. Okay, so there we go. Republicans, Democrats, even convicted criminals. Everybody supports that we should do more to stop influence peddling. This is the kind of good government reform that Americans of all political stripes support. 
And I should know, in 2022, I passed that exact reform as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act with a bipartisan majority vote. What happened to that amendment? Why didn't it become law? The answer is simple. Nearly 500 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. And too many people around here want to follow in their footsteps and so don't want to make it harder for government officials to become lobbyists. Ultimately, Democratic leadership under then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi let the amendment get stripped out of the final bill. When I offered up the amendment again during this Congress, Republican leadership under then-Speaker Kevin McCarthy never even put the amendment up for a vote. Both parties have let us down on fighting influence peddling and tackling corruption. But I'm hopeful we can begin a new approach in this very committee. American, the American people should know that regardless of, American people, regardless of party, should know that an investigation was conducted into whether Joe Biden did anything wrong. We followed the evidence to where it led a dead end. So this impeachment inquiry should end today. And where should we go from here? We should stop partisan attacks on each other and address the real problem, that the American people believe that the rules that prevent corruption are way too weak, to stop politicians on both sides of the aisle from influence peddling. This committee should be working together in a bipartisan way to change the culture of Congress, to crack down on influence peddling and corruption, and just as importantly, to stop the perception of it let me give you some facts. I don't even need a whiteboard for this one. 495 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. 467 members of Congress take corporate PAC money. 78 <coughs> members of Congress violated the Stock Act last Congress. Clearly, we have our work cut out for us, so let's start the conversation today on what a bipartisan ethics reform package could look like. Here are the organizations that could have come today as witnesses so we could have had a productive conversation. Oversight staff, do you have your notebooks ready? Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, Common Cause, Project on Government Oversight, Public Citizen, with the right witnesses and the commitment to doing what the American people want, this committee can have a real conversation about the problem of influence peddling, and we can pass legislation to create badly needed ethics guardrails. That would be real work, not a real circus. I yield back. Uh, before I recognize Mr. Timmons, Ms. Porter, I think you are sincere, and I look forward to working with you on that legislation. Chairman, can we take a five minute break? I need to go to the bathroom. Uh, let, let us get one, one more and then we'll do that. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Timmons for, for five minutes, then we'll take a break because we have votes coming up anyway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At our hearing last July, I laid out the scheme that the Bidens concocted to sell the Biden brand, netting almost $30 million for various members of the Biden family. This scheme was repeated with various clients in Kazakhstan, China, Romania, Russia, and Ukraine. I'm going to spend my time on just one instance, Ukraine, specifically involving Burisma, which netted Hunter over $3 million during a three-year period. And to clarify the criminal offenses being alleged, for Hunter Biden, it is conspiracy to commit bribery, 18 U.S.C., Section 201B, uh, 2A, and C. And for Joe Biden, it is conspiracy to commit extortion under color of official right, 18 U.S.C., Section 1951B, 2. And if you want a refresher on those, just look up Senator Menendez and his wife's indictment. Um, so let's start with this. Foreign client has a problem. I've got an email here um, from Vadim Pazarsky, the Secretary of Burisma, and he is advocating that Hunter Biden intervene with um, U.S., high-level U.S. officials to facilitate meetings and communications expressing their positive opinion of Zlachevsky, the president of Burisma, to the Ukrainian president, chief of staff, prosecutor general, with the ultimate purpose to close down any cases against Zlachevsky in Ukraine. Uh, this is dated um, November 2nd, November 2nd. Now, keep in mind... The foreign client has a problem. Zlachevsky is being investigated by Viktor Shokin, the uh, inspector general of Ukraine, and he needs help, the Biden brand. So here we got 
bank records galore of Hunter Biden receiving prior to this email over a million dollars, after this email two million dollars, you'll find out in a second he really earned his fee. So again, client pays a Biden three million dollars. Next, what is it? What happens? What happens? This is great. Eleven days later, eleven days later, we have. Uh, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine announcing that Vice President Biden is traveling to Ukraine on December 7th. Oh, interesting. Vice President Biden travels to the country. Here we got a great photo of him touching down. They're very proud of themselves. So Vice President Biden leverages U.S. policy to achieve a favorable outcome for the client. We've all seen the video. He brags about leveraging U.S. foreign uh, loan uh, guarantees to get the Ukrainian government to fire Viktor Shokin to end the investigation. Again, we've got the email from Podarsky saying that we need to leverage you, who have not provided value yet for your million dollars in service, uh, Hunter. He brings in the big guy. Biden leverages U.S. influence, withholds a billion dollars in loan guarantee to fire Shokin. So if that's not enough, we got the victory lap here. We got a, an email just a few months later saying, oh, whoa, we won in less than a year. You brought us in, so take a victory lap. So look, I mean, this is straightforward. This is straightforward. Pay to play. It is bribery. Hunter Biden was paid $3 million at the lowest point in his life. He testified in the deposition that he was drug addicted, that he's never been to Ukraine. Yet he's paid $3 million to get his father to go to solve his client's problem. That is the scheme. Mr. Bobulinski, does this sound like the scheme that you've seen the Biden family do? I wasn't involved in Ukraine, but the uh, facts surrounding this are very similar to CFC and uh, Romania. Thank you for that. So this is the thing. If Hunter Biden were here, we would be able to ask him some questions, maybe clear this up. But he's not. He's not here. And what's interesting is that just yesterday, Peter Navarro reported to federal prison in Miami for four months for not showing up in front of the January 6th committee. And I want to point out to everybody that the January 6th committee was procedurally defective under House rules. It was procedurally defective because uh, the minority leader did not get to appoint members to that committee. The United States House of Representatives Oversight and Accountability Committee is a procedurally uh, perfect committee. And we have authority to subpoena Hunter Biden, and he has to show up. He has to answer these questions, and he has to tell the world that his father didn't leverage U.S. foreign policy so he would get $3 million. This is no different than what Senator Menendez did. And look, the American people are not buying this nonsense y'all are selling. We have to restore, we must restore their faith in our institutions. And we have to stop this ridiculous two-tiered system of justice where uh, the Department of Justice persecutes President Trump and uh, hides Hunter Biden behind every uh, corner. I mean, this is not the United States of America that the American people deserve. And we have to get our country back on track. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry, did the committee subpoena Hunter Biden today? The chair recognizes, uh, uh, pursuant to the previous order and at the request of the minority witness, the chair declares the committee in recess uh, for 10 minutes. Then we're going to come back in here, and then we may have to recess again for votes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is another unfortunate attempt by my Republican colleagues to muddy the water in an election year with no proof, no evidence, no wrongdoing at all by President Biden. The American people are tired of this charade. As I said before, my Republican colleagues simply grasp at straws that do not exist. While House Democrats in the Biden-Harris administration work to cut costs of prescription drugs, expand student loan forgiveness, and mitigate the threat of gun violence, Republican members of Congress continue to chase after Russian disinformation campaigns from the 2020 election, which have been thoroughly debunked again and again. And as usual, in this committee, we know who is in charge. It is the bondless, broke bluffer, twice impeached, four times indicted, insurrection initiator, election denying, self-declared dictator on day one, and puppet for Putin. The one who wants to terminate the Constitution and defund the FBI.
the one who romanticized exchanging of love letters with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un, the one who just last week embraced autocrat Orban of Hungary to discuss their diabolical plans to destroy our democracy, the one who proposed a policy to ban Muslims from this country, the one who just this week said any Jewish person who votes for a Democrat hates their religion and Israel, the one who called neo-Nazis carrying tiki torches tenting Jews will not replace us, good people. The one who referred to African nations as, I quote, shithole countries. The one who called NFL players, the majority whom are black, sons of bitches for taking a knee in protest of the ever-present racial inequality and police brutality that continues to pervade our justice system. The one who called Mexicans rapists and promised to build a wall and have them pay for it, and in case you missed it, it didn't happen. The one who told women of color from the United, born in the United States, elected to Congress and serving on this very committee to go back to their own countries. The one who bragged about grabbing women by their private parts. The one who confused his rape victim, whom he claimed was not his type, for his very own ex-wife. The one who is an admitted and committed adulterer, who attempted to pay off a porn star for her silence. The one who has publicly mocked people with disabilities. The one who dodged the draft and referred to prisoners of war as losers, the very people who pay a high price so we can enjoy the freedoms that far too many of us take for granted. The one who boasted about being able to stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue to shoot some and shoot someone and not lose votes. The one who promoted political and physical violence multiple times, including most recently at my rally in the home state, my home state of Ohio, where he declared there would be a bloodbath if he didn't win. The one who intentionally denied COVID was deadly and eventually suggested testing, injecting bleach into our bodies to kill the respiratory virus that took the lives of one million people in the United States. The one who ordered his son-in-law get top secret security clearance, overruling concerns flagged by officials intelligence officials, who, according to this committee's chairman, admitted the former president's son-in-law crossed the line of ethics by accepting a two billion dollar investment into that very same son-in-law's fledgling firm only six months after leaving the White House. If any of this sounds crazy, it's because it is. This might sound unbelievable, but it's all true. These are facts indisputable facts, a thing that is known and proven to be true. This may be a foreign concept to some of my colleagues, but for those of us who still have a relationship with the truth, please know this is not an exhaustive list of inappropriate, unethical, and questionable behavior by the maniacal manipulator of Mar-a-Lago because I could go on, but I only have five minutes. Yet here we are again, trying to make sense out of nonsense. I would humbly respectfully ask my Republican colleagues on this committee to stop falling over yourselves to win the approval of one because millions of people are depending on you to defend our delicate democracy. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time to Ch Chair no. the, the ranking member. Seven seconds. Oh, I don't know that there's much time left, but thank you for that eloquent and compressed recitation of um, some of what we've lived with over the last few years. Chair recognizes Mr. LaTurner from Kansas for five minutes. Mr. Bobulinski, I want to talk about May of 2017. To be clear, Hunter Biden was doing business with CEFC while his dad was VP. Are you aware of that now? Yes. Rob Walker told us, that during his trans told us that during his transcribed interview before the committee. But I want to talk to you about your meeting with Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and Jim Biden in May of 2017. Other members are going to bring up the meeting you had with Joe Biden at the Beverly Hilton the night before the Milken Conference, but I want to talk about the next day when you win as Joe Biden's guest to the Milken Conference. So, you watched Joe Biden deliver a speech that day. Then you had a follow-up conversation with Joe Biden. Isn't that correct? Correct. What did Joe Biden tell you during that conversation? Well, as I've already publicly uh, shared, you know, I was brought backstage by his team um, because he had just given his keynote. and. You know, we just exchanged pleasantries and then I walked him out to his car and he specifically thanked me for the work I was doing with his son and his brother and asked me to keep an eye on them. 
And my understanding is, Mr. Bobulinski, that after Joe Biden had left, you went across the street to the Peninsula Hotel and had a long conversation with his brother, Jim Biden. Isn't that correct? I did. It's my understanding that you asked him how the Biden family does the business that they do, while Joe Biden is such a prominent political figure. What was Jim Biden's response to you? Correct. I was actually concerned and asking from a position of concern, and Jim Biden's response to me was plausible deniability. Plausible deniability. And by that, you mean Joe Biden would be kept in the loop, but you weren't supposed to talk about it, especially in writing. Mr. Galanis, during your transcribed interview with the committees, you said a very interesting phrase. Say it, forget it, write it, regret it. Does this sound familiar? Is this consistent with your understanding of how the Bidens do business, Mr. Galanis? Yeah, very, very much so. That was an operating principle, yes. But it looks like someone made a mistake. Mr. Bobulinski, you created two companies with the Bidens. I want to show you an infamous email discussing the ownership structure of one of those companies, CEFC. You can see on the screen, 20% for H, 20% for Rob Walker, 20% for James Gilliar, 20% for Tony Bobulinski, 10% for Jim Biden, and 10% held by H for the, quote, big guy. Mr. Bobulinski, who is the big guy? The big guy is 100% Joe Biden. Mr. Bobulinski, Hunter Biden didn't respond saying, knock it off. We can't include Joe Biden, did he? No, and that's actually a critical point because remember- Mr. Bobulinski, did, did you ever get a text message or a group text message or anything like that saying, guys, knock it off. Joe Biden isn't involved in this deal. No, the whistleblowers actually have a text exchange where they're talking about everything else but that. And the reason why they weren't talking about it is because everyone knew Joe Biden was the big guy. Hunter Biden begged for a public hearing, but it turns out he is too afraid of accountability to show up and tell the truth to the American people. But Americans don't need Hunter's testimony to know they are being gaslit by this president. It's blatantly obvious to anyone paying attention that Joe Biden is the big guy. The CEFC deal broke the say it, forget it, write it, regret it rule of the Biden family businesses, and now they are trying to cover it up. Joe Biden said repeatedly that his family never made a dime from China. But Mr. Bobulinski just confirmed that Hunter, Jim, and the big guy himself all got a cut from the CEFC China energy deal. Let me be clear. The only service the Biden family ever provided was their ability to leverage the office of the Vice President of the United States to cash in overseas. My Democrat colleagues are going to try and tell you that Joe Biden wasn't on the final ownership structure agreement, but isn't it true? If someone was holding Joe Biden's stake in the company, it wouldn't appear in the document. Isn't that the whole point of this email, to hold, hold Joe Biden's stake so his name wouldn't be in the document? Isn't this just plausible deniability in action, Mr. Bobulinski? It appears that way. But plausible deniability only gets you so far. Now, I want to fast forward from May to the end of July of 2017 when the Bidens cut you out of the deal. I want to show you a message that Hunter sent to his Chinese business partners. Please put it up on the screen. Hunter writes, quote, I am sitting here with my father and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. So, when Hunter Biden is desperate for money, Jim Biden's old trick of plausible deniability doesn't cut it. And when desperate times call for desperate measures, Hunter Biden let the cat out of the bag, said the quiet part out loud, and gave the game away by calling on his father to help him shake down his Chinese business partners for the money. And it worked. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, just point of inquiry. The, the, what was the last image we saw uh, that, that you put up? Where, where did that come from? I just want to authenticate that. Uh, this is the Ways and Means, Means Committee Exhibit 300. Must be the Irish whistleblower note. Uh, uh, not an inquiry, though. Anyway, uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Stansberry for the last question. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the GOP's day-long campaign for Donald Trump. 
Uh, I want to start with Mr. Galanis to help connect some dots that have not yet been connected in this hearing. Mr. Galanis, you are serving just under 16 years for, among other things, as has been said today, defrauding a tribal nation and specifically a tribal corporation held by the Ogallala Sioux, which is why you are testifying from a prison today. But I'd like to ask you, Mr. Galanis, have you had an attorney representing you before this committee that you retained last December? And that attorney's name is Mr. Mark Pauletta, correct? That's correct. And when you first testified before this committee in a taped interview, you were actually stopped by Mr. Pauletta from answering just a simple question about how you met him and who exactly was paying your legal fees. Now, I want to make sure that the American people understand exactly who Mr. Pauletta is, because he is, in fact, a former lawyer to Donald Trump, who served in the administration in the Office of Management and Budget, and was at the the center of the Ukrainian pressure campaign for which Donald Trump was impeached. And in fact, Mr. Pauletta was Trump's chief OMB lawyer when he withheld aid to Ukraine to try to extort the Ukrainian government into investigating Joe Biden to support Donald Trump's campaign. And Mr. Pauletta literally wrote the memo to help withhold those funds. Now, I want to dig in a little bit on this pressure campaign, and Mr. Lev Parnas is here to discuss as an eyewitness who was there. Mr. Parnas, we appreciate you being here, and I want to move through this quickly, so just ask for simple yes and no answers. You've testified here today that Donald Trump repeatedly asked you and through Rudy Giuliani to put pressure on the Ukrainian government to dig up dirt on Joe Biden to support Trump's co campaign, correct? 100 percent, yes. And as we can see here in this picture, you were very much a business associate of Rudy Giuliani during this time. And as established in your testimony, you traveled to and met with Ukrainian officials and told them that the White House would support, would withhold its support and aid to Ukraine if it did not cooperate with this bribery, essentially. That's correct. And as we all know, Donald Trump's administration and specifically the Office of Management and Budget did withhold that foreign aid in 2019. And here's the guy who did it. And he's representing the witness who's literally on Zoom with us for this committee today. And it's the reason why Donald Trump was impeached the first time. And the man at the center of that scheme is involved in the House GOP's inquiry. But I also want to point out that Mr. Pauletta is also involved in and very much in bed with the Thomases. In fact, he represented Miss Jenny Thomas, Clarence Thomas's wife, in her involvement in the Stop the Steal before the January 6th. Uh, committee, and actually also goes on vacation with Mr. Harlan Crow and the Thomases. So this man has quite an interesting roster and uh, participation in this hearing. But the bigger picture here is that Mr. Pauletta's presence is yet another indication of the way in which this hearing and this impeachment inquiry is part of Donald Trump's larger misinformation campaign, just like it was in 2020, where in addition to pressuring and withholding aid to Ukraine, Rudy Giuliani and the Trump Organization, as Mr. Parnas has established, planted the story in the media. And now here we are four years later as they've dredged it back up and are planting it back in the media using Congress using this committee and using a baseless impeachment supported by Donald Trump's own allies on this committee to push that information out. As members on this committee have trafficked in false evidence that was planted by a Russian operative to the FBI and is now in jail for that. All of this is in the service of propping up the criminal enterprise for which Donald Trump is at the top and has already been twice impeached. Rudy Giuliani and others have been exposed as they continue to traffic in Russian disinformation that not only props up Donald Trump, but it props up Vladimir Putin himself and his goals back in Russia and in Ukraine.
So I just want to point out here that once again, as I said when we had a false impeachment hearing a few months ago, that once again we see the time's long expired, arm, gentle ladies. Time's expired. hands of Donald Trump all over this hearing. And and just want to state. You made a mistake and said that uh, Mr. Parnas was a Republican witness. He is very much your witness, not a Republican witness. But I was a Republican for Donald Trump. Mr. Chairman, I do not Pursue it. I said that so we can... Pursue it to the previous order. The chair declares the committee in recess due to votes. Uh, subject to the call of the chair, we will reconvene 10 minutes after the three votes. All right, committee will reconvene. Uh, Chair now, re now recognize Mr. Perry from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Galanis, I'm going to uh, turn my questions to you. I hope I can see you on the screen here shortly. Are you there, Mr. Galanis? There you are. Okay. Uh, if we can jump right into another Biden-Chinese deal made while Joe Biden was in office, a deal I think you described in your interview as a quid pro quo, where the Chinese sent millions in exchange for a post-VP uh, job for President Biden. Can you tell us what was Burnham? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> Burnham was an 85-year-old uh, financial services company based in New York uh, that owned an asset management firm and a, and a securities dealer. Um, but relative to the Chinese, it was an unimportant small uh, player at the scale one and a half billion dollars versus three hundred billion dollar Chinese company. So, so what was Hunter Biden's interest in working with them, knowing that that was the situation? Um, I think Hunter Biden was already working with them through the, the, the fund that was created, Har the BHR Harvest was the age, and is described in some of Hunter's emails that I have provided to the committee, he described those, the activity with BHR, meaning the, the harvest activity, as one of his only focuses, and his other focus would be the activity between harvest directly and Burnham directly in a combination. So his stated objective in his own words, in writing, was those were to be his only focus and his only priority in working with, with the Chinese on a go-forward basis. Did you also say that he said the, the interest in working with Burnham was to make billions instead of millions? Is that right? Yeah, I did say that, and that was on the basis of uh, looking to become um, a much larger company where his equity interest would be worth a lot of a lot of money, billions, not, you, not millions. And you said the Harvest Fund was a $300 billion Chinese financial services company. Was it likely connected or was it connected closely to the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government? That's my understanding. Okay. And, and who was Henry Zhao? He's been described to me consistently by uh, Devin and Hunter as the chairman, um, uh, but he's essentially the head of, of Harvest. I think he's had a couple of different roles over the years, but chairman is the best way. To, he was always characterized as chairman and, and the decision maker for that entity. Right. So he's the chairman of the $300 billion Chinese entity connected to the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party. And he was based out of where? Where did he, where was his base of operations? In Beijing, China, PRC. And like you said, you heard him referred to occasionally as, as Chairman Zhao, right? Most of the time it was Chairman Zhao out of a sort of a respect for, for the chairman. Yes. Okay, so now there came to a point where Hunter wanted to bring Henry Zhao, the chairman of Harvest, and their billions of dollars from China into business with Burnham. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct, Congressman. And, and why would he do that? The, uh, it was a, a financial decision. Um, Chinese offered money, and he offered political access. Okay. Uh, it was an exchange. Fair, fair enough. It's, it's pretty obvious what Harvest brings, right? $300 billion. Um, but why would Harvest be interested in Burnham versus other financial institutions? I'm sure there are other ones out there, and like you said, it was fairly small. Harvest is $300 billion. Why would they care about... Uh, about this small Burnham, what, what what was the interest for them? 
I mean, the self-evident answer is, is, is the political access, and then, and then sort of underscoring that is there are at least two emails uh, produced that talk about ex exactly that, the influence of what Henry Zhao uh, had, Hunter had uh, characterized as Henry Zhao's interest in the access vehicle. Um, so that was, uh, that was sort of explicit and, and in writing. Okay, so Joe Biden was going to sit on the board of a Chinese company connected to the highest levels of the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party. Stepping back in your dealings with Hunter, what was the value that Hunter brought to the table? Uh, it, was, it was the access to the, the inducement um, to induce companies like this Harvest Group to participate in Burnham. So it was uh, a... Uh, we'll call it relationship capital that he brought to the table, not financial capital. Relationship but capital that economic they, value to the business. Relationship capital that you described as the Biden lift. What was the Biden lift? Biden lift was, was simply Hunter's access to his father and his father's power and prestige uh, in influencing the growth of a financial services business, which largely reliant on its reputation and ability to attract uh, other, other clients. I'm running out of time here, but uh, it sounds like a quid pro quo to me. Uh, sir, what, what did Harvest, and Harvest did in fact invest money in, 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 Burnham, uh, in Burnham? You called it a material inducement. Can you explain what that means? And do you know how much yeah. the Chinese paid? I believe I was out of the picture toward the end of 2015. I believe that they ended up paying $4 million uh, into Burnham. Uh, I believe, though, as a result of the legal entanglements that I encountered, that the transactions didn't happen in the way people expected or that they had written about in, in terms of uh, what the Chinese were expected to do. All right, Mr. Galanis, I just want one last question. I'm going to show you a draft email that you provided to the committee. Uh, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Objection on time. Uh, good job. Chair, now recognize Ms. Crockett for one minute, or five minutes. <laughs> one minute. All right. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, member, Mr. Bobulinski, do you know who Elections LLC is? Yeah. Mark. Well, it's not a who. Okay. Well, do you know what it is? Yes, it's a... Uh, LLC. Okay. And is it the LLC that your attorney works for? Uh, I believe so, yes. You believe so. Okay. Um, so at this point in time, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a document indicating that the law firm representing Tony Bobolinsky was paid $10,000 as recently as January of this year by the Save America PAC, which you may recognize as Donald Trump's PAC. Without objection. Thank you. Now, so far in this hearing, it has felt like the worst episode of The Apprentice. I'm sure you're familiar with that show. It seems like my colleagues and maybe you and some others are trying to become the next vice president of the United States of America. You're auditioning or something like that because, Mr. Bobolinsky, I know that you take exception to the fact that your credibility has been called into question over and over. But when someone comes to testify under oath, whether it's before this committee, behind closed doors, or in person, then we have to evaluate someone's credibility. And sir, I definitely have always had issues with your credibility, as I know that you are very well aware of. So let me remind you of well, what you, happened behind <coughs> closed doors. I well, you should asked, ask Ro Khan about my credibility. I haven't asked credibility. you a question. Okay. You are? When I, I haven't. So oh, when okay, I ask I'm you a sorry. question, that's when you answer. Otherwise, I'm talking. So Excuse me? with my time, because it's my time, I want to be clear that when we were behind closed doors, you called a number of people liars. You called the Wall Street Journal liars. You called Cassidy Hutchison a liar. You she called is. the FBI a liar. You called Rob Walker a liar. You called James Gillier a liar. You called Hunter Biden a liar. You called Jim Biden a liar. And just today, you added to your list, you called my colleague, Congressman Mr. Goldman, a liar as well. It seems like, according to you, the only person that's telling the truth is you and everyone else is lying. But... I want to move on to something else. Is that a question? Or? It's not a question. Okay. You'll know when I ask you a question, I promise. Thank you. So, the other thing that I want to talk about is um, the fact that my 
colleague from the other side of the aisle talked about the company that we keep. And she wanted to go through a list of people that she felt like were bad company because right now the majority has been relying upon the testimony of someone who's currently sitting in federal prison. And we know that your company is the company of somebody who's been found liable of fraud, uh, as well as defamation, as well as sexual uh, assault, and for whatever reason, can't pay his bills uh, at this point in time. But I'm gonna ask Mr. Parnas, so this is a question to him. Are you aware if Trump had any associates that have been found guilty of anything? Yes, lots of them. Lots of them. Me included. You included. Okay, so when you were called here to testify, you weren't called here to testify for any other reason than to tell the truth. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, Congresswoman. Now, we started this whole sham off because of the 1023, and that was debunked by you, was it not? Yes, Congresswoman. Way before we started this impeachment inquiry. And you mentioned a number of times this guy by the name of Rudy Giuliani. Yes. Now, you know, everybody is so stressed about the fact that Hunter ain't here today. But, you know, Hunter came and testified behind closed doors for over six hours. And every single one of them, they weren't limited to five minutes. They could ask whatever they wanted to. And there is a full transcript of his testimony. So I don't know what else they wanted to do besides the fact that they wanted to put on the show. But let me tell you something. This whole thing is based upon something that Giuliani came up with. Yes. And, and we tried to subpoena him if I'm... That's what I remember, if anybody else remember. We tried, we asked, we said, hey, we should subpoena Giuliani. But you know, kind of like when we were trying to get his cell phone, they shut it down, right? Like, they don't want the facts. But you would agree with me that considering the fact that you were working under Rudy Giuliani at the time that you went over to Ukraine, that he has maybe some valuable information that he could offer this committee as to whether or not there's anything that we should be investigating in the first place. Absolutely, Congresswoman. I wish that this committee would subpoena Rudy Giuliani, put him under oath alongside me to get to the bottom of the truth of what actually happened in Ukraine and to the manipulation that Trump and Giuliani and the team went to do. I, I agree with you, but somehow it doesn't look like we're going to get there, and I thank you for your time. Uh, Time's, ex I'll yield. Time's expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Biggs from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Galanis, on May 9th, 2014, you received an email from Devin Archer confirming, or you wrote an email uh, confirming that B Ms. Baterina was investing with uh, Burnham Investments, uh, 15, 15 to $20 million. Is that true? Yes, Congressman. And uh, let's talk about the predicate for that. Uh, Ms. Baterina is the richest woman in Russia, and you knew her, and were you invited to a party that she attended? Yes, in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, yes. Let's have the invitation up, please. And here's a copy of the invitation that you received, is that right? No, yet yeah, see it, Congressman. Uh, I did receive a, uh, an email invitation, so yeah, yes. An, an email invitation. And did you go to that party? Yes, that, I did attend that party, yes. And was Hunter Biden at that party? Yes, he was. And we know that he was because we have a confirmation of his calendar, which is the next exhibit. It was noted on there, and he showed up there. And so all of that's true. It's all verified right there. And um, Yelena Baterina and her then husband Yuri, they were at the party, right? Correct. With Devin Archer as well? That's correct. And during that party, you guys, uh, uh, Hunter pulled you guys, the people we just named, pulled them away from where the party is, and you go to a separate little area where it's quieter because there was over 100 people at that party. Is that true? That's true, yes. And all of a sudden, Hunter says, okay, I'm going to make a phone call. He makes a phone call, does he not? He does. To whom? Uh, he called his father. Then Vice President Joe Biden, who was Vice President at the time. What was said on the call, please? Um, Wait the, a second. Before, the, before the you tell us, the way, reason you know it is because he put it on speakerphone, right? 
He did. After he said hello, um, and then he put it on speakerphone. So I was first party to hearing it. And uh, initially, please sum it up. His, his, our, I'm sorry, Congressman. I talked over you. The yeah, video please, conference. please, please sum up. Please sum up that phone call for us, Mr. Galanis. Okay. He, he, it was a relatively short call, but it was uh, he, he indicated that our friends had come in from out of town. Uh, that then uh, uh, the exchanges it testified was was the related to um, the they were going to proceed. Things were going to proceed, um, and uh, he said uh, the, the vice president had said, "You look after my boy." And it was and, um, and it was five days after that party that you received word from Devin that Ms. Baterina was in for 15 to $20 million with you guys, right? That's correct. Let's go to a different uh, issue. Let's go, let's go to the, the harvest issue. And I'll just re re refresh everyone's recollection. When, when Devin Archer was there, because at that time, he had to come in. He came on in and we had this great conversation with him. I said, Miss, hey, did Hunter ever indicate to you that the Chinese anticipated that after his father was out of office, he might join their company with one of their companies as a paid advisor? Mr. Archer says, did he intimate that? I said, did he, did he indicate that to you? Mr. Archer, I don't recall, but potentially. I don't recall, but potentially. And I said, you don't recall, but it's not new to you. The concept is not new to you. Is that what you're saying? He said, no, it's not new to me. Why wasn't it new to him? Why wasn't it new to him? It wasn't it's new. because that was. Yeah, go ahead. It, it was an explicit discussion amongst, uh, amongst us that that was an inducement to the Chinese to invest in the Burnham business. When you that said, being the, the VP's position post uh, uh, is his uh, position, official position. On a board of advisors, paid board of advisors. Of the Chinese company, Harvest, yes. And when you say us, who was the us that was discussing that? Uh, the, it, what I was referring to in just making that comment was Hunter, Devin, and myself. Let's go to something there else. Was a broader, broader, there was a broad, broader sort of circulation group about that, and that was reflected in an email from a, Thor, a, a, a staff member at Thornton Group who circulated the draft email that also reflected he had a similar conversation and, and drafted a, a letter based on that understanding. How long have you been incarcerated, Mr. Galanis? Uh, I've been incarcerated for eight years, Congressman. And you offered to tell the uh, mm -hmm. Southern District of New York and SEC about Hunter Biden's company, Rosemont Seneca Bohai, and they rejected your offer, didn't they? On multiple occasions, that's correct. And why do you think they rejected that offer? Chairman, I think he's over. Okay. Time's uh, expired, but please answer the, the, answer the question. Answer the question, Mr. Uh, I mean, all I can tell you is what counsel said to me. Which was? Okay. Counsel had indicated to me that he had never seen um, a, a prosecution reject uh, information, particularly paper-based information, uh, that, that could have been could have corroborated my uh, verbal statements. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you. Very good. Chair recognizes Ms. Bush for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. St. Louis and I are here today once again to focus on the real issues that affect our communities instead of this partisan circus. Let me start by saying that influence peddling is absolutely a very serious issue, full stop. But we all know the truth. Donald Trump is the quintessential influence peddler in chief. Despite this, for well over a year now, House Republicans have spent dozens of hours of precious committee time hearing testimony from nearly 20 witnesses on their baseless and increasingly embarrassing attempts to link President Biden to actions of his family members and implicate him by association. Even after all this time and effort, they haven't been able to muster up any credible links between the president and his son's business dealings. All they have proven is that they will do whatever it takes, including using their razor-thin majority and chairmanships to waste the people's time. Let's let today's hearing be the final nail in the coffin of this sham impeachment investigation. I urge my Republican colleagues to admit that their quest to impeach the president has completely collapsed. They have fallen short, and with each passing deal, they are losing votes and credibility, even within their own conference. It's time for them to move on. But that's not likely to happen. 
because my Republican <clears throat> colleagues don't care about responsible governance or making people's lives better. They don't have an affirmative agenda. They would rather distract us all with these unfounded accusations against the president. So it's no coincidence that under Republican leadership, 2023 marked the most unproductive year in modern history for Congress. Aside from a failed impeachment investigation and unprecedented three week stint without a without a speaker and bringing our country to the brink of a catastrophic government shutdown multiple times. Republicans have done absolutely nothing to demonstrate why they deserve to control any member, any chamber of Congress, let alone the White House, for which their cult leader, a twice impeached, four times indicted former president is running to gain influence and control again. They're just grasping at straws and it'd be comical if it wasn't leading to real harm and real hurt in our communities. The people of our country are the ones paying the price for their failure to actually govern. Instead of wasting all of our time, our hours and hours and hours going down fake rabbit holes and amplifying baseless conspiracies, we could focus on actual policy. We could focus on substance. We could focus on saving and improving the lives of our constituents not misusing precious time and resources of this committee. What I'd rather focus on is the people who don't have the money and resources to buy influence. The millions of people in our districts who have been harmed by the ongoing refusal of the federal government to take full responsibility for the Manhattan Project waste and who are still getting sick from exposure to toxic radioactive waste their own government created. It still lingers in communities all across the country, like in St. Louis, Missouri, where proper cleanup still remains undone. I am ranking member on the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Energy Policy, and Regulatory Affairs. I have repeatedly requested a hearing on Manhattan Project waste and its countless victims. I'm still waiting. We could focus on ending the crisis of gun violence in this country. Every day, 327 people are shot in the United States. Every year, 42,654 people die from gun violence. More children die from guns than anything else in this country. Why are we not acting to protect them? How are we not treating this like the public health emergency that it is? We could focus on improving the lives of incarcerated individuals and weaning ourselves off of the carceral state. A currently incarcerated individual is your star witness today. I applaud your inclusivity. And surely, if folks convicted of crimes can testify before Congress, they should be allowed to vote. Why not enfranchise them? What about reproductive rights and freedom? We have a public health crisis in this country where millions of people of reproductive age can't get the care that they need. People in St. Louis are being forced to give birth against their will. Republicans need to use abortion, they need and use abortion care just like the rest of us. Why not meaningfully address this issue? We need to focus on ending the atrocities in Gaza and Israel. Since January, malnutrition in children under five has doubled, nearly doubled. Global experts warn Famine is imminent for 1.1 million people, half the population due to catastrophic food insecurity. Why are we not acting to reinstate UNRWA, prevent famine and the spread of disease and ending the continued slaughter of Palestinians? We do not have time, have infinite time and resources. I will stop there. Thank you, and I yield the balance of my time to Rep. Goldman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ten Bush. seconds. <clears throat> I want to just point to a, uh, a photo here. Mr. Bobolinsky, you have testified that Cassidy Hutchinson's account that you met Mark Meadows, then chief of staff for Donald Trump, at a Trump rally in Georgia behind Secret Service cars. You were wearing Time's a mask. Time's expired. Sir, you went uh, over a minute late with uh, Mr. Perry. If we could have a little extra time. But th if you, the Trump rally, that you said Time's that she expired. Was Chair now recognizes Mr. Sessions for five minutes. Mr. 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 Chairman, could we have some basic no, equity? We, we, uh, if here. someone else wants to yield, she had eight seconds to yield him, and he's got up here with a speech. He's already. No, uh, abused his privilege by making a motion a that wasn't question. even a motion. Chair has no, ruled. The chair has ruled. The chair has ruled. What are you? you what are you afraid of, Mr. Chairman? Recognize your. What are you afraid of? Why don't you let me ask what the you, question? Chair recognizes the gentleman from. Oh, what purpose do you seek recognition, Mr. Biggs? A unanimous consent to introduce the documents into the record. Without objection. Thank you, no Mr. Order. Chairman. Here, here they are. Um, one is the invitation that was mentioned. Another is Hunter Biden's uh, calendar. Another is the email mentioned uh, confirming that uh, uh, Yelena Ballerini was going to invest 10 to $20 million with him. Another one is page um, 180 of the Galenis interview 
page 56 of the transcribed interview of Hunter Biden and also pages 41 and 42 of the Galanis uh, interview. Without objection, so ordered into the chair, record. Now, UC Chair, what purpose do you seek recognition, Mr. I, I have a UC motion, Mr. Chairman. Proceed. Um, I would like to enter into the record the portion of the Devin Archer transcript where he says that Yelena Batarina never had any business dealings with Hunter Biden and that money went into their joint account was done by mistake. By mistake. Okay. Without objection. And Mr. Sorry. Chairman, I have one UC request as well. Proceed. This is from Salon Magazine. It's embarrassing. Republicans worry they have zero accomplishments to run on in elections. Without objection, so ordered. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'd first like to uh, uh, enter into the record uh, 302s that were uh, done with Mr. Bobolinsky, what's known as Exhibit A, 400A. Thank you very much. Mr. Bobolinsky, thank you for being here. Mr. Parnas, thank you for being here. And those of you who are appearing uh, extraneously uh, on our screen. Mr. Bobolinsky, tell me about, very quickly, about the professionalism of the organization that you work for in terms of paychecks, getting paychecks, uh, providing the IRS with documentation uh, of people who were paid out of the organization. I'm not sure I'm following your question. Were you ever paid? Uh, I was not. So you were never paid by this organization? I was not. Did you ever receive any enumeration? Uh, when we were in the process of trying to shut down Sinohawk Holdings LLC and Oneida Holdings LLC, I was compensated. Uh, it wasn't a compensation, it was a reimbursement of $50,000 of money I'd come out of pocket traveling around, paying for hotels and stuff like that. So, so in other words, People did not get paid, or you didn't get paid that you were aware of. Were you aware that other people were being paid? Uh, the Biden family was paid. Hunter and Jim Biden were clearly paid millions of dollars. And how would you think that that uh, information would be transmitted about them pay receiving that payment uh, and going uh, to the IRS? I'm not sure of those specifics. I'm just aware that they received those millions of dollars, obviously, based on the brave uh, testimony of uh, Shapley and Ziegler that came public with a bunch of information, and then uh, Senator Johnson and Senator Grassley's report. I never saw. The only bank account I ever saw is the one I set up at J.P. Morgan for Sinohawk Holdings and Oneida Holdings LLC. J.P. Morgan was well aware that the Biden family were owners in that business. They authorized it, approved it. And what it social security business. number was utilized to set up that account? Uh, for Sinohawk and Oneida? Yes. Uh, we used, we had to represent the owners of the underlying entity, so they were aware that Hudson West 4 owned 50% of Sinohawk Holdings and they provided their information. On the Oneida side, we represented that each of us owned 20%, and um, I'd have to go back and look. I, as the CEO, probably provided my Social Security number. Um, I'm not sure if we provided Social Security numbers for all five members. And yet you or, never, excuse me, tax IDs for their LLCs. Or tax IDs. And yet you never received money except reimbursement for out-of-pocket expenses that were related to the business. Correct. And imagine that $50,000 I was paid was actually from uh, the legal side of Sinohawk Holdings and the Chinese while the Bidens had defrauded me and were receiving millions of dollars into their own pockets. Were you aware that they were receiving millions of dollars at the time? I was not. Did you spend time with, with uh, the Department of Justice on this matter? I did. I did. I had a voluntary interview with the FBI on October 23rd, I believe, uh, 2020. They approached you or you approached them? Uh, my lawyers coordinated me. Uh, I, uh, which is obviously public knowledge, went to the second debate. I flew to D.C. with the intent of sitting in front of Senator Johnson, Senator Grassley and their committee. And then my lawyers uh, sought counsel, had discussions and decided it was a better focus of my time to walk voluntarily into the FBI. So where did you do that? Uh, in Washington, D.C. Main, main, main justice, main FBI, or, or the uh, field office? I believe it was the leading field office. They didn't want to do it in main justice for some uh, uh, their reasons. They decided. I would have gone wherever they asked me to go. 
Did they tell you at the time that you were providing information that if you provided information that was not true and correct, that you could be held liable for that under criminal statute? Yeah, yes, of course. I appreciate you asking that question. I was uh, operated as if I misrepresented, misstated, lied that I was committing criminal offenses, which I take very seriously based on the fact that I was willing to die for this country. And to just correct Ms. Crockett's statement earlier, I didn't accuse the FBI of lying. I stated in my transcribed interview that the FBI made mistakes in their 302. My lawyers never saw that document after my interview until it was made public to the world. And then you attempted to correct that 302. I did. Is that the same 302 known as Exhibit 400A that I have entered in the record today? It is. Do you have any other dispute with that? And have you, have you looked at it? And do you have any other dispute? Well, there's numerous mistakes in it. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you have any reason to believe that all of these uh, SAR reports that have come out of banks were all fraud? And, as and gentleman's heard? time's expired, but he asked a question about the SARS report. No, I mean, just the, the number of SARS reports should give every American pause. The average American in this country will never receive a single SAR in their entire life. So for a family or an individual to have over what I've publicly seen, 150 of them, is just extraordinary. Thank you very, I want to thank all the witnesses that are here today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, time's expired. Chair, now recognize Mr. Frost. Or who? I thought you said Mr. Frost. Oh, Mr. Kassar. Frost was next. Kassar. Thank you, Chairman. And, and if I could have my full five minutes, I'd appreciate yep, that. Five, five, uh, reset the clock for five minutes for Mr. Kassar. Thank you, Chairman. While we clearly disagree on the merits of this meritless investigation, I hope, Chairman, that we can at least come to an agreement on some basics. I believe that you and I can agree that presidents and White House officials should not be unduly influenced by foreign powers. So, Chairman, I'd be happy to yield to you briefly for a yes or no. Can we all agree that White House officials should not be bribed or unduly influenced by foreign actors? It's your time. You, I, you I, can I, ask. We have witnesses I would, here. I would assume that you would agree. We have, if you, we have witnesses. If you want to ask the witnesses question or you want to waste time with me. I'm not I, wasting time with you. I think that I'm, we've been disagreeing all day. I hope we can come to an agreement that White House officials should not be bribed or unduly influenced by foreign powers. I think you and I agree on this point. I see you nodding your head. I assume that that is a yes. Um, I'm glad that we can work as an oversight committee on investigations. Uh, do the work we need to do and make sure that no one in the White House has betrayed the public trust. We've spent countless hours talking about Hunter Biden, investigating every single person it seems like he's ever shaken hands with. We've not found a shred of evidence that connects it to the president of the United States or anyone with any say over U.S. policy. But someone who has worked in the White House did accept money from a foreign power. Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, received a staggering $2 billion from Saudi Arabia for his brand new private equity firm. And while Hunter Biden never had any say over U.S. policy, Mr. Kushner got this $2 billion six months after working in the White House as a senior advisor on Middle East policy. Mr. Kushner had no experience in private equity. In fact, he was so inexperienced that Saudi officials tried to block the transfer of the money until the crown prince overruled them. While working at the White House, Mr. Kushner pushed through a $110 billion weapon yield. sale for Saudi Arabia. I'm finishing my point and then I'm happy to talk about it. He then defended the deal in the wake of the Saudi government's murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And while this may all just be a coincidence, there's many questions. Like, was any of this money passed along to Trump? Was the Saudi money a thank you for a job well done in the White House? Was Jared given this money in exchange for anything else? Or did someone with no experience just have a lucky payday? These are questions we should have answers to. But the gentleman yield for a second. That the Oversight Committee should look into. Uh, but we Mr. can Rath just add another question. Uh, what was the role that Jared Kushner played in covering up the assassination and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, we ordered by the Royal Commission, ranking member. And so, so, I want to know, if Hunter Biden had accepted $2 billion from the Saudi government, I'm sure we'd be looking into that today. And Mr. Chairman, I believe we can agree 
that there should not be undue influence in the White House. And I believe we should be able to agree that we should look into these questions about Mr. Kushner. And in fact, Mr. Chairman, you were on CNN and said, quote, I've been a vocal, uh, I've been very vocal that I think what Kushner did crossed the line of ethics. And then in our deposition of Hunter Biden the other day, when we were discussing Mr. Kushner, you said, Mr. Chairman, and I quote from the deposition, when we deal with influence peddling, we'll ask about Jared Kushner. Well, today's hearing is titled Influence Peddling. So we are here. So Mr. Comer, I would love to hear from you. Can we fulfill our responsibility as an oversight committee and determine if Saudi Arabia bribed or unduly influenced Jared Kushner or other White House officials? Is that something we'd be willing to look into? We've already had a conversation with Ms. Porter. I'm going to answer one time. Ms. Porter and I have pledged to work on influence peddling legislation. We'll take up all the people who have been accused of influence peddling. We'll try to determine whether Jared Kushner has a real business. We haven't been able to find a real business that the Bidens have had yet. Now, just still your time, Mr. So, so could we expect to subpoena Mr. Kushner's correspondence with the Saudi government or his firm's financial records or financial transactions? between Mr. Kushner and his father-in-law. Is that something that we would consider doing as part of that hearing you just discussed? What was the question? If we are, if we are serious about looking into foreign money, I saw recently a, a poster board here about $100,000 to a car dealership. Are we going to be serious about the $2 billion from the Saudi government to Mr. Kushner? Would that? My question is, would we be at least subpoenaing Jared's correspondence with the Saudi government and his firm's financial records. Can we commit to doing that? I think it's important to see if they if there were real legitimate businesses. And if what, there what was, was what, let me ask you a question. What was the what business was Hunter Biden in? We heard explicitly from Mr. Biden. We heard explicitly from Mr. Biden I'd, about his extensive business record and his experience on boards. Uh, we heard about time, that. Time's Mr. expired. Kushner, on the other hand. Chair now recognizes Mr. Dollars. Fallon for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, before, a shame. I, before I start my questions, I'd like to enter into the record, uh, submit to the record an article from the Kiev Post, uh, and, and then a second article from the Kiev Post uh, entitled Prosecutor General Shokin Resigns, and it's updated. If I get another interview. Without objection, to ordered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I sat in on the entire seven-plus-hour deposition that Hunter Biden gave to this committee, and one of the things that stood out to me was his assertions with a rather braggadocious flair of his business experience and his acumen and in his impeccable qualifications. He claimed with quite some vigor, I might add, that he was a brilliant, accomplished, and highly sought after business commodity. He's very successful and he had an unparalleled resume that he recited to us chapter and verse to prove it. That was at least the face his lawyers this administration and the House Democrats wanted him to wear. Of course, there's another possibility, one that this pesky little thing we call reality, that he was a spoiled, entitled East Coast patrician with a senator and then VP daddy who squandered his many life advantages and spiraled into a decadent behavioral pattern of narcissistic excess and criminal addiction. And to feed his very large carnal appetites, he acted as his family's bagman in an influence peddling and access selling scheme that netted the Biden tribe over $24 million in illicit foreign cash. Lots of money, little effort in a get rich quick scheme. If he was such a skilled and gifted businessman as he claimed, his services would be sought after, in fact, even fought over. Mr. Boblinski, to your knowledge, how many Fortune 500 companies retained Hunter Biden on their board of directors? Uh, now or in his ever uh, I can't confirm any yeah because there aren't any zero how about how many energy companies retained Hunter Biden I'm, I'm sorry how many American energy companies retained Hunter Biden on their boards of directors zero zero nada correct there was one energy company that retained him on their board of directors do you know what that name of that company was yes Burisma Burisma correct where's Burisma located Ukraine really that's interesting because um, and he was hired actually for no small sum a million dollars a year Hunter Biden said in his deposition he could bring, and Mr. Chairman, I apologize for laughing, but he said his corporate governance to the table. He brought something far more valuable than his corporate governance. He brought his, in, in his fictitious business acumen, he brought his daddy with him. You see, Joe Biden just happened to have been given the country of Ukraine in his portfolio of responsibility to oversee by the Obama administration. So let's go over some facts, Mr. Chairman. Fact. 
Burisma and CEO Mikola Zolchevsky had been investigated for corruption. Fact, in September 2015, then U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Jeffrey Pyatt specifically mentioned Burisma as a corrupt entity. Fact, Burisma was paying the son of the Vice President of these United States a million dollars a year to serve on their board. Fact, December 2015, Joe Biden visits Ukraine, demands Viktor Shokin, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, who's investigating Burisma, his son's boss, be fired. Fact, uh, February 2nd, 2016, Kyiv uh, Post reports Viktor Shokin won a court order to seize assets of Burisma CEO Mykola Zolchevsky. Two weeks later, fact, Shokin resigns. President Poroshenko called on him to resign. He resigned. He essentially was fired at the behest of Joe Biden. Fact, 2016, February, two weeks later, there's a little email sent from Vadim Pozarsky, COO of Burisma. He's an executive of Burisma. And to Hunter Biden, asking him, hey, Hunter, will you help us out? We want to get the embassy in the, United, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine to say that we're a good company. Now, the ambassador just said they were corrupt a few months prior to that. And then, lo and behold, with the seal of the United States Embassy, they say that we have no negative information or feelings about Burisma. So what changed in those six months? It was magic. The power of the vice president's visit when he demands that his son's boss, who's, uh, his, the prosecutor who's investigating his son's boss, be fired, and he's going to withhold a billion dollars worth of aid, uh, actually, it's five, I think loan guarantees, if Shokin's not fired, and then Shokin is fired, the embassy says that Burisma is a great company. Our Democratic colleagues would have us believe, Mr. Chairman, that that was all magic, that there was no coincidence here. And with that, I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Jordan. I, I appreciate the gentleman uh, yielding. I was just going to point out that Jared Kushner was one of the key officials involved in the Abraham Accords. If we want to talk about influencing foreign, how about the president of the United States, what he said in the State of the Union regarding Israel? And how about what the Democrat leader of the Senate said last week in that Israel should change its prime minister, for goodness sake? That, that, to me, is a concern. Jared Kushner was doing good work with the Abraham Accords. Of course, the Democrats don't want to admit that. I appreciate the gentleman for yielding. Chair Nell, recognize. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I have a motion. I would uh, move pursuant to Clause 2K6 of Rule 11 that the committee issue a subpoena to Jared Kushner to compel testimony related to the $2 billion collected from Saudi Arabia uh, after his service within the White House. Second. There's a motion, and for what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Uh, move to table the motion. There's a motion is not, the motion to table is not debatable. Uh, as many as are in favor of tabling signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion to table is agreed to. The committee will now resume consideration of this hearing. Now, Chair recognizes, is it Ms. Lee? Who's next? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. I think it's fair to say at this point that Republicans on this committee are relying on Mr. Bobolinsky as their star witness. The only fact witness they have brought in, uh, in person, before this committee. So I think we'd all expect that Mr. Bobolinsky would have extensive inside knowledge about the involvement they allege that President Biden and in Hunter's uh, business ventures. As Mr. Parnas can vouch for, previous impeachment inquiries relied on whistleblowers and witnesses with intimate details of what went on, you know, firsthand accounts of high crimes and misdemeanors. You could point to exactly what the allegations were and understand what was going on. There were laid out chains of events pointing to a named crime, lying under earth, under oath, excuse me, obstruction of justice, abuse of power, incitement of insurrection. Yet we're left floundering here with zero direction and zero real evidence while we watch this kangaroo court struggle to continue on. And today we have Mr. Bobolisky, whose biggest contribution is that he had, quote, multiple meetings with Joe Biden. But let's be clear. He spoke with Joe Biden a grand total of two times in the span of less than 24 hours in 2017, and each was short. One in public 
in the bar of a hotel and then for a few minutes backstage of the Milken Conference after Biden spoke about the efforts to fight cancer, which took the life of his son, Bo. I think we also need to clarify that while Mr. Bobolinsky is all of a sudden today claiming that they talked business, but at no point did he mention this during his deposition under oath with this committee. At two different points when asked about what was said in these conversations, Mr. Bobolinsky's account made clear that he had zero substantive business discussions with Mr. Joe Biden. Mr. Bobolinsky described those conversations twice during his transcribed interview, and both times he provided the same account. I'll read from the transcript of your interview, Mr. Bobolinsky. You stated that you and Joe Biden discussed your, quote, family background in detail, as well as the Biden family's background and Joe Biden's, quote, appreciation for the military, pages 48 through 52 and 268 of two, to 271 of the transcript uh, had these accounts. Based on your own account, you had zero discussion of CEFC, the Chinese energy company. You had zero discussion on shares of equity or capitalization, of this failed business venture. Based on your own account, you simply exchanged pleasantries about your families and shared values, the kind of small talk any person would make if they had the opportunity to meet the former vice president of the United States and moved on. Yet today, when my Republican colleagues are so desperate for actual evidence, magically that story changes. And that's really at the heart of everything we're discussing today. Mr. Bobolinsky has also been pushing his texts as records as proof, yet the Wall Street Journal found that none of it showed any role for Joe Biden and Senate Hawk Holdings, and even Fox News reported that there was zero evidence of business dealings involving Joe Biden. Mr. Bobolinsky would have us believe that everyone is a liar except him, and except for when he's under oath that everyone misremembers except for him and except for when he's under oath. The FBI, the Wall Street Journal, his business associations, all liars. Republicans in this committee and the culture warriors of Fox News keep look, saying, look at the documents, look at the documents. So let's look. This purported investigation has received over 100,000 pages of documents and not a single one shows any evidence of any wrongdoing, much less an impeachable offense. And taking a step back, even if Joe Biden had discussed his son's business ventures with Tony Bobolinsky in 2017, and this is rhetorical, so what? What would be the high crime of Mr. Me or misdemeanor? What would be the, impeach the impeachable offense? We're talking about what private citizen Hunter Biden was doing with his time at, at the time, private citizen dad. This impeachment inquiry is not about facts or evidence. It's not even about impeachable offenses. It's about keeping the American people distracted while we do nothing on reducing gun violence, nothing on lowering health care costs, nothing on reforming our criminal legal system. This has been the least productive Congress in decades. We're just now, in March, finally funding the government for this year. That's shameful. This unserious hearing is a waste of our time and our, research, and our resources. I, will yield, I yield with that, and I um, yield the remainder of my time to uh, Representative Crockett. Yes, I just want to make sure that I point out, and this is not a question, just in case you wanted to know, that on page 174 of your transcribed interview, line 9, um, it says, this is an absolute lie in reference to talking about the FBI, what you stated. I did not call the what FBI was stated agents right liars. before that was, first of all, I said that I'm speaking, and I did not ask you a question. First of all, it doesn't say Tony Bobolinsky told the FBI. This is a summary of two agents that took notes through my interview, and their summary, apparently, that they presented says Bobolinsky first met in person with members of the Biden family at a 2017 meeting in Miami, Florida. This is an absolute lie. That is what it says. The final thing that I'm going to say is about this. What we have from Kim Buck, a Republican, I don't think that the impeachment of Biden is appropriate, and so House Speaker Mike Johnson's ability to talk me into staying here is going to be right. about as successful as his ability about yep. talking me into an unconstitutional right. impeachment. I'll let, I'll let her have 30 seconds over. Chair now recognizes Mr. Burchett from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On July 30th, 2017, Hunter Biden wrote to his Chinese business associate, Raymond Zhao, I'm sitting here with my father, and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. Mr. Bobolinsky, why did Raymond Zhao work for the, um, who did Raymond Zhao work for when this message was sent? Raymond Zhao worked for Director Zhang at CFC. Is CEFC connected to the Chinese Communist Party? It is. Is CEFC a corrupt organization? It was. From your perspective, uh, what has occurred 
what had occurred with CEFC from the end of May to this July 30th text message? Well, it's, in, it's tough to go through all these details in 20-second clips, but at the end of July, it's important to note Jim Biden was broke, Hunter Biden was broke, published by uh, sh um, the brave whistleblower Shapley and Ziegler, and Hunter made the conscious decision to basically defraud the partners of Sinohawk Holdings and Oneida because he needed money immediately. They've published pages of text messages where he's trying to get money into his bank account. And so that night, for whatever reason, on the 30th, when he asked why hasn't the commitment been fulfilled, the commitment he's talking about is actually the $10 million funding into Sinohawk Holdings, LLC. Really key point. But the next day, he decides that he's going to defraud Sinohawk Holdings in Oneida, create a new entity called Hudson West 3. Well, actually, all, change Hudson West 3. It had already previously been created by the Chinese and make himself a 50% owner in that entity. So when the Chinese did send money, he would have instant access to it. Really important. Backed up with tens of pages of communications. He wanted to get access to the money the second it came in. And in Sinohawk Holdings and Oneida Holdings, he did not have that power. I just want to address one thing real quick. Hunter Biden represents he's a governance expert. That's why Burisma put him on the board. Well, he obviously can't do basic math. The board of Oneida Holdings had seven votes. Each one of them, Hunter, Jim Biden, James Gillian, and Rob Walker had a single vote. I had three votes. I have a master's degree in electrical and nuclear engineering. I think I can do math. I had three, they had four. They controlled Oneida Holdings. So Hunter Biden's representations that I was trying to take the business from them or I didn't know is all a sham and a misrepresentation. He wanted money in his account instantly and that's why he shook down the Chinese and they were willing to send him that $5 million because they viewed it as a bribe to the Biden family. They say it in their own communications. Are you aware or not that they pay taxes on any of that? I, have no, uh, I can only go from public testimony. I was not involved in their taxes. Okay, on July 31st, the next day, Hunter, uh, says he hopes Kevin should know that the plan to speak is highly confidential. And Raymond Zal responded, CEFC is willing to cooperate with the family and the priorities to solve the problems mentioned last night. What family was Raymond Zal talking about? Was it the Well, Biden? the family was a Biden family, and more importantly in that text is what is he talking about is the confidential manner. The confidential matter he's talking about were four sealed indictments in the SDNY where they were about to indict executives of CEFC that we now know. I didn't know that in July of 2017, but the SDNY knew. Charles McGonigal, who's now apparently going to serve 78 months in prison, ran counterintelligence for the FBI in New York City where Chairman Yee was dropping $50 million of cash for penthouses in Manhattan. So who you should be asking all these questions are the Department of Justice, the SDNY, the FBI, because they have troves of evidence that back up what was going on in July 2017 and in August 2017. So I apologize, Congressman, to be so passionate and to take your time, but this is what I need you guys, or I, the focus has to be of your oversight committee. This involved the Chinese Communist Party. They were doing a transaction with Rosneft, which was a Russian-sanctioned U.S. sanctioned company at the time, and the Biden family was right front and center in the middle of it. Thank you. I switch gears for a second. I wish Hunter Biden were here because I'd like to ask him about his taxes. I want to know if he paid his fair share, just like his dad's asked Americans to do. I want to know if he's, he's current on his taxes, and if he isn't, I'd la like to ask him why, when he pan plans to pay up. Mr. Bobby Linsky, you're a businessman. Did you pay your taxes? I did. Mr. Bobby Linsky, actually, he actually pays his taxes unlike the president's son, and yet Democrats on this committee act like Hunter is the believable one out of, out of you two. Joe Biden has no right to lecture the American people about their taxes until he gets his own house in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Chair now recognize Mr. Moskowitz for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. By the way, how are you doing? Good? Okay. Uh, Mr. Bobolinsky, over here, how are you doing? Yes. Good. So I, I just have a question. We've been at this for 15 months now in oversight. I know this is your first time here. But do you think Chairman Comer 
has proven that Joe Biden has committed a high crime and misdemeanor? I believe with all the evidence he's gathered, yes, he's proven that Joe Biden has committed high crimes and misdemeanors. Okay, and so I assume you believe Joe Biden should be impeached. Well, that's up to you guys. <clears throat> but do you believe he should be impeached? It's yes or no. Well, I personally believe yeah, yeah, or yeah, you. under constitutional... No, no, no. You personally, do you believe he should be impeached? I do. Okay, and you believe that because you believe Chairman Comer has proven that he committed a high crime and misdemeanor? No, because I know that he committed high crimes and misdemeanors. Okay. I was involved and saw them happen. Right, but obviously, with all the evidence, you must believe that all of these hearings for 15 months, that the chairman has proven that, right? Did you re-ask the question? <clears throat> sure. I, I, I'll, I'll sum it up. I assume you believe he should be impeached. But my, my point is, is that the chairman has not yet moved for that. And, and so, look, chairman, we got, we got like three and a half minutes here. I mean... Let's just do the impeachment. I mean, why continue to waste millions of dollars of the taxpayers' money if we're going to impeach because you believe you've shown he's committed a high crime and misdemeanor? Let, what are you waiting on? Let, let, let's just do it. I mean, by the way, we got Chairman Jordan here also, the double chairman. Why aren't you guys calling for the vote in your committee? When, when is it going to happen? When, when can we tell the American people you're going to stop wasting their money and just call for the vote on impeachment? Gentlemen, I mean, yield. Gentlemen, yield. Sure. We don't do snap impeachments like you guys. We actually do the facts. We do oversight according so you're to the you're Constitution. So you're never going to call for it. You're never going to call for it. I mean, you, well, now you can predict. Months. You can predict the future. How well, do you know? You, only, you guys only have six more months, probably in power, right, until the election. So are you going to you to do it in two months? Are you going to do it in three months? Like, tell the American people. Does the Constitution put a time limit on oversight? Oh, no. so I that, don't think I didn't. I didn't read that in the Constitution. So, means, so you, if you believe you don't, you don't can't call for the impeachment now, then what you're admitting is you haven't yet proven that he's committed a high crime and misdemeanor. You haven't proven it yet. Otherwise, you would call for it, I assume. We're doing our work. Okay, so, our so they haven't proven it, right? They haven't proven he committed a high crime and misdemeanor. Otherwise, we would call for impeachment. So I just, look, you know, the chairman knows me well. I mean, I'm just here to help him, right? And so I just think we should do it today. Let's just call for it. I'll, I'll make the motion, Mr. Chairman. I want to help you out. You can second it, right? Like, make the motion to impeach President Biden. Go ahead. It's your turn. So you second it. No, nothing. Okay, we got nothing. So I want to, with my last couple of minutes, show the American people that they're never going to impeach Joe Biden. It's never going to happen because they don't have the evidence. Okay, this is a show. It's all fake. They just want to do these hearings. It's not leading to impeachment. They're lying to their base on Newsmax and Fox, leading these people to believe that they're going to eventually impeach the president. It's not going to happen at all, ever. Period. They don't even have the votes, even if they had it in committee. They don't have the votes on the floor. They know that. They got members resigning rather than taking a vote on the fake faux impeachment. Just ask Ken Buck, who said the speaker ain't going to get me to take an unconstitutional impeachment vote. I mean, boy. I mean, so, uh, look, I mean, if this hearings, if these hearings were a success... Right. If if what we've been doing for the last 15 months had convinced the American people that Joe Biden committed a high crime and misdemeanor, you can be damn sure they would have called the vote by now. Right. But they want it to go on. They well, they either want it to go on because they don't have the evidence. Are you asking me a question? Oh, no, I'm, no, I'm just oh. looking at you. Oh, okay. But, but we, if you want to talk to me, we can talk. Well, no, I think you haven't read uh, recent data that shows the American people are well aware of the Biden's corruption. Perfect. So then ask the chairman why he hasn't called for impeachment, Tony. He's right here. Ask, ask Comer. Hey, Comer, how come you haven't called for impeachment? I'll do it. Watch. Hi, I'm Tony. Hey, chairman, how come you haven't called for impeachment? When are we going to have the hearing? When is the vote going to happen? I mean, I, you believe it. He believes it. He says it every day on TV. I just don't know when we're going to have the vote. You, I mean, you, just let's, you, let's just go. Let, are can, you asking we, me to hold we the can vote? Save, no, sure. I just like looking at you. Yeah. We, we, can save, we can save the taxpayers millions of dollars. So, I mean, look, I used all of my time to show that this vote is never going to happen because they have no evidence on Joe Biden. I yield back. Gentlemen, this time's expired. Chair, now recognize Mr. Burleson from Missouri for five minutes. Switch back. Re restart the clock. Look at the mirror first.
actual you thought. served in prison for telling not me. <laughs> you, you have all everything ready. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep talking. <laughs> You'll be in the same. We'll get you a mic. Do you, do you want to go to that one? Okay. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> All right, are we good? Now we are. All right. I want to start with Mr. Galanis. Mr. Galanis, um, you've heard the expression, say it, forget it, write it, regret it. Have you heard that expression? Mr. Galanis? Yes, I'm here. Congressman? Have you heard the expression, say it, forget it, write it, regret it? Yes, I have. It was a practice that we used in, in our business. In whose business? Uh, business with Hunter Biden and Devin Archer. Okay, so it's their expression. Um, let Correct. me ask you a question. Who is Harry's Youssef? Harris Youssef is a Ukrainian uh, investor originally from Syria, a, a longtime colleague of uh, <clears throat> Dmitry Firtash. So he's a colleague of Dmitry Firtash. He was mentioned um, earlier this hearing. Who is Dmitry Firtash? He's a Ukrainian oligarch very close to the Kremlin that was, made his fortune primarily in trading uh, gas uh, from Gazprom, the Russian state oil company, oil and gas company. So connected to Vladimir Putin, correct? Very much so, yes. Yeah, in fact, during Hunter Biden's deposition with the committee, he justified his role. This is, I think you'll find this comical. He justified his role on the Ukrainian Burisma board by saying, in essence, that it was his patriotic duty, that he was serving, you know, freedom, because there were, quote, this is his quote, there were two gas companies inside Ukraine at the time. One of them was a state-owned, which was highly corrupt and connected to people like Furtash, which was directly going into Vladimir Putin's pocket. The only independent company was Burisma, end quote. Now, my question to you, um, based on this, you know, he's disparaging Mr. Furtash, and yet, are you aware that, uh, that Mr. Biden, Hunter Biden, did business with Mr. Furtash? Yes, I am. So let me ask you, um, what kind of financial transactions occurred between them? Uh, what Harris Youssef described to me, and then I was also described to me by, by others, including Devin and Hunter, was a $5 million payment that was made by Dmitry Furtash is handled by Harris Youssef through uh, Hunter Biden's law firm. Uh, that was deemed a success fee in order to quash uh, an outstanding indictment for which uh, in the United States. So a Putin-connected Russian oligarch wired over $5 million to, to Hunter Biden's law firm for for what activity? What was Hunter supposed to do for that five and a half million? He was supposed to perform uh, in quashing the indictment that resulted in a, an arrest warrant for uh, Dmitry Furtash, who was um, in, being charged in the United States. In yeah, being charged yes, in the United States in Indiana. So he's supposed to quash that, use his political influence to do so. So my question is, of that money, um, the five million, three million dollars made its way to a company that you set up with Devin Archer called Imbloom. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And finally, from that three million dollars, there was a transfer that was made, and I've got a copy of that, the bank record to prove that, of two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Do you recall that transfer? I do. And it went to yes. which account? Uh, Rosemont Seneca Bohai. Rosemont uh, Seneca Bohai. So. Despite Correct. what Hunter said during his deposition, were, for, based on your knowledge, was Hunter Biden connected to Rosemont Seneca, Seneca Bohai? Was he part owner? Uh, very much so, and he said, said as much and, and, and had uh, direction and control, and, and it was a beneficiary of the account. So he, he, there are emails that document he directed monies uh, to be dispersed from that account, including to himself. Now, it sounds like, despite what he's saying, you know, that he's that what he told the committee that this guy was a bad hombre basically that this Furtash guy connected to Putin and therefore he he had to get on Ukraine and yet here's a yet he had no problem doing business for this this corrupt Russian oligarch connected to Putin in fact had no problem taking million 5 million dollars and a direct uh, transfer of 275,000 would you 
Would you agree? I agree with that, yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Bobolinski, um, and I've got just a little bit of time left. Sorry, very little time. So I want to ask you, you know, for God's sake, Hunter Biden is doing all of these transactions, doing all of this business, and yet his father is vice president. And we're to believe that his father isn't aware of all of these uh, he's been on the phone calls, he's been in the meeting, and yet he's not aware that his son is doing business with people connected to Vladimir Putin? Are we to believe that? It's an absurd expectation. Thank you. My time has expired. Very good. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Frost for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The claims made against the President of the United States have been so completely proven to be lies that even House Republicans now are admitting that it's time to close this case. Mr. Parnas, I have a few questions for you in limited time, so I really want to try to get through these. And I just want everybody to know, especially people watching at home, that you're, you're like one of the most credible witnesses that we've had throughout this entire impeachment <laughs> inquiry. Um, first off, I just want folks to know, for people who aren't familiar, can you tell me who you were working for between 2018 and 2019? Rudy Giuliani and Donald J. Trump. And to be clear, did you, you answered to Rudy Giuliani. Yes. You answered to Donald Trump. Yes. Directly. Directly to Rudy Giuliani. Yeah. When former President Trump and Rudy Giuliani flew you to Ukraine um, to look for corruption on the part of President Biden, did you find any? No. And following your Ukraine trip, Senate Republicans, Senator Grassley and Johnson, released their Burisma report, which the New York Times concluded was, quote, unproven allegations that echo an active Russian disinformation campaign, end quote. Mr. Parnas, are the unproven allegations that are at the heart of the Republican report the same fabricated claims that Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani sent you to Ukraine to go dig up? Yes. Last summer, you wrote a letter to Congress noting that when the media started to get tired of the smoke screens and, and using this, one of the authors of the Republican Burisma report would be your, quote, guy in the Senate to push all the information, end quote. What, what did you mean by that? Uh, Senator Ron Johnson was our guy in the Senate. He was told to me that uh, when we push the information, he's going to push it in the halls of Congress. So when the media was getting skeptical about pushing disinformation after they've proven it wrong time and time again, the, the, the plan was to have a U.S. Senator, Ron Johnson, to push that disinformation even further. Correct, because we had Congressman Nunez already doing it, so Senator Ron Johnson jumped on board. This Congress, both Chairman Comer and Chairman Jordan, have centered this entire sham impeachment hearing on an uh, FBI tip sheet. This tip sheet made wild claims about bribery that didn't even come close to being backed up. Um, and in fact, it's all being proved to be one big lie. Mr. Parnas, is the allegation um, in the FBI tip sheet based on the same fabricated claims that Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani fl flew you to Ukraine to dig up? Yes. I also want to make it clear that the informant allegedly behind this tip sheet is facing criminal charges for lying about the Biden family and was a known fraud for years before that. The same fabricated claim kept popping up and getting smacked down over and over again. In fact, our colleagues at the Foreign Affairs Committee did some amazing work on this in investiga uh, an investigation and found that this lie dates back to December 2015, almost 10 years ago. Do you happen to know um, the article that I'm referring to? I don't know the exact article, but I do know that the, the slide has started way back in 2015. Started ten, about 10 years ago. It was an article entitled, quote, the Ukrainian scam of the Biden family, end quote. And it was posted to a Russian language media website registered in a city in Russian occupied Crimea. Crimea. Mr. Parnas, do you have any doubt that this fabrication claim the claim that Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani sent you to Ukraine to try to dig up more information on is part of Russian propaganda um, and an effort to destabilize Ukraine and undermine our democracy. As I, as I sit here today, I have zero doubt that Russia is involved. This is a Russian campaign to in interfere in our elections. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it from someone with firsthand experience. Look, to recap, there's no evidence that support allegations that President Biden engaged in corruption in Ukraine. We know this. Mr. Parnas himself has made it clear that we have no doubt, we should have no doubt, that the claims of corruption are lies and conspiracy theories rooted in a Russian effort to undermine our democracy, posted to a Russian-language website over a decade ago. 
This is exactly what Putin wants. And over the years, Republicans have kept moving the goalpost. You just look at the past year, right? First, it was a bribe. Then it was Burisma, nothing. Then it was Hunter Biden's laptop, nothing but some like nude pics that we keep seeing here. Then it was supposed money laundering scheme that turned out to be a family member making a couple of car payments. And now Republicans on this committee have left the pretense of a crime behind and are moving the goalpost to influence peddling, uh, which sounds more like what former Pro President Donald Trump did in his time in office. I, look, we've been laughing a lot about this, calling it theater and a sham, which it is. But I also want to bring up that this is really serious. Yes. I mean, we have members of Congress and this committee using Russian propaganda meant to undermine our democracy, to undermine our president. It's not just theater or laughable, but it's a betrayal of our democracy. It is very serious, Congressman. Yes. Chair, yeah, yield back. time's expired. Chair, recognize Ms. Boebert from Colorado for five minutes. Well, Hunter asked for a public hearing. Here we are, and he is nowhere to be found. I guess Hyden really does run in the Biden family. Now, Mr. Bobulinski, in your testimony, you state, it is clear to me that Joe Biden was the brand being sold by the Biden family. In your experience, what is the value to Joe Biden in helping his family collect millions from foreign adversaries? What, what's the value to Joe Biden specifically? Yes. Well, his children and brothers uh, were enriched, which to AOC's questions earlier violate corruption statutes, RICO statutes, FCPA statutes, FARA statutes. Yes, yeah, so you would agree that the Biden family was involved in this corruption and influence peddling and selling access to the federal government? I do. Mr. Bobulinski, um, in your experience, did President Biden play a more active or passive role in uh, his son Hunter Biden's business dealings? I quantified it previously as he was the ch he acted sort of like a chairman. He showed up and shook He's hands. He's been called the chairman. Yeah, he showed up, shook hands, and that's all the Chinese, Ukrainians, Romanians, Russians, whoever was need. It's not what the Canadians, the Australians, and Americans need, but in those parts of the world, that's what they need. Thank you. And now I'm going to switch over to Mr. Galanis. Uh, during uh, his 2020 presidential campaign, then candidate for president Joe Biden said his son did not make any money from China. Did did Joe Biden lie? Yes or no? Yes. Mr. Galanis, uh, you are aware of the BHR fund that consisted of Bohai, a Chinese state-backed company, Harvest, a China company, and Rosemont, uh, the Biden entity, correct? Yes, I am. And Mr. Galanis, you're aware that Hunter Biden formally held 10 percent of that Chinese entity. And, w and would it surprise you, if you are aware, uh, that Hunter Biden held 10 percent of this entity well into his father's presidency? You know, I'm aware that the, it was founded as a business that he owned 50 percent of 20 percent or 10 percent directly from the outset, from uh, uh, early on in 2014. And, and would it surprise you, Kevin Morris, Hunter Biden's fake attorney, has testified that he now holds that interest? I, I don't have any knowledge about that, so it would, not much of this would surprise me. Mr. Bobulinski, in your testimony, you stated the Chinese Communist Party, through CEFC, successfully sought to infiltrate and compromise the Obama-Biden uh, Obama White House during 2015 and continued through when Joe Biden left office. Would you agree that the CCP compromising the White House is a serious threat I to do. our nation's national security? I do. Thank you. And now Joe Biden has leveraged his elected position to enable the Biden family, their business associates and their companies to receive over $24 million from foreign nationals and their companies to re uh, and their related companies. Biden is compromised and is a threat to our national security. After today, it's clear that Joe Biden is a bigger CCC, a CCP asset than Fang Fang herself will a threat to our national security. After today, it's clear that Joe Biden is a bigger CCC, a CCP asset than Fang Fang herself. Will, uh, will we ever come to the agreement that it is far time that Congress holds the resident of the White House accountable for selling out the American people? Unfortunately, my colleagues to my left have, highly, have a highly coveted Made in China product, a brand, if you will, and that is Joseph R. Biden. Mr. Chairman, I gain, uh, yield the remainder of my balance to my friend from Florida, Matt Gates. Mr. Parnas, how much time did you spend in prison? Four months. 
Four months. But four you, months. But you were indicted for crimes that could have resulted in you spending 50 years in prison, right? Right. There were false crimes. The, the judge uh, saw, saw through it. Well, well yeah. you, you, you went to trial and you were convicted, right? I went to trial, correct. And, you, and, and the crime was that you were trying to acquire marijuana licenses and you took money from a Russian oligarch and you tried to use that money to go give political donations and do what you had to do to acquire marijuana licenses. Is that about right? That's what the crime was. That's what the indictment was. Yeah. Right. So it sounds like everyone here today, the only one working for a Russian oligarch was you. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, I, it was. I, I just heard I, you. I, I, I mean, it's, I heard, public, I just, it's public information. Yeah, that, no, I just uh, heard Congressman you wax poetic. I got paid $200,000. You know so how much I got really paid. You were really worried about our democracy, and you were here to warn us, but you were working for a Russian oligarch on behalf to get of President Trump. marijuana licenses, but then you didn't even do it. The fraud you committed against the Russian oligarch was that instead you spent the money on yourself. So, like, was, was no, that what you that were doing to fight against no, that was Russia's not the aggression? That's a lie. Just Thomas taking their Bates. money? Well, that's what you were convicted of. No, but, but instead of spending 50 years in prison, you got four months. As this hearing continues, I look forward to hearing what Mr. Galanis thinks about how he was treated by the DOJ for telling the truth as opposed to how you're treated for lying. The DOJ didn't that. listen to the truth because if they would listen the, the to the question, truth, you the guys question Mr. All Gates had is they for didn't Mr. Hear the truth. You can't handle the truth, Matt Gates. Look, well, the truth for you is taking money from Russians to buy marijuana businesses and then and then going to jail and then coming here to lie about Trump. You should know better uh, than anybody. What, gentlemen's what, time has expired. About. Chair you now, should know better than anybody. Gentlemen's time's expired. <laughs> Chair now recognizes Ms. Tlaib from Michigan. Thank you so much. It's so exhausting. Um, this is really incredibly exhausting, and I can't imagine our residents sitting at home I still, every time I look up and I see our former chairman, uh, forever chairman, uh, Elijah Cummings, our first ever hearing in this, in this room was about the high cost of insulin. I think one of the first witnesses was a mother of twins who had to ration her insulin and lost a child because she couldn't afford it. I still remember our previous chairwoman who really did a phenomenal job continuing to talk about the opiate crisis and how the Sadler family was part of a criminal scheme to increase addiction among family members, people just literally losing their family members because of profit, because of folks that were literally drug dealers in suits. All of that to say is this House Oversight Committee, from our committee hearings on the Postal Service, which really matters to our constituents, the high cost of prescription drugs, the housing issues, uh, the, the number of struggles and challenges of everyday Americans. And I say this sincerely. I know you all do, sincerely, because what a waste of time. What a waste of time. Just even some of the colleagues uh, of, of my folks here continue to say this is a waste of time. I mean, Troy, uh, Representative Niels said, quote, I don't think we have the will to impeach Joe Biden. Just for the record, impeachment isn't something you have a will to do. It's something you have to have evidence to do. Which brings me to the next, I mean, you know, you heard about Rep. Don Bacon, who said, when the staff tells you that they can't identify a particular crime, there's a problem. That's a problem. I mean, you can go on and on. One top Republicans admit that there's no conclusive evidence of impeachable offense that shows Biden acted improperly while in office to enrich his family members. I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, uh, former uh, Oversight Chair uh, Daryl Issa, who serves on Judiciary Committee now, said, I think he goes on and says, there's no clear sense of where the impeachment inquiry is going. It goes on and on. I mean, look, you all, this is an incredibly important committee. We could be doing some phenomenal things and holding currently the Biden administration on a number of issues. Like, I want to know. I want to know about the American Rescue Dollars and where that money is being used. Is it being used towards public health? Is it being used towards the crisis that continues to happen in many of our families being impacted by long COVID um, symptoms? I mean, these are things that we could be doing right now in this chamber. We're not. We're doing this over and over again, and it's, it's a waste of time. I literally, every time I talk to my constituents about this, they don't bring this up. They said, God, when is this going to be over with? I tell them, my colleagues do not know how to lead the campaigning at the steps of the Capitol. 
When we come in here, we have to literally put that aside and work for our constituents. Work on getting uh, some sort of understanding where we can prioritize making sure that we have access to clean water. What is going on with the lead abatement program within the administration? Talking about the specific challenges that we continue to see in our healthcare system. All of that, again, we can hold the Biden administration together, Mr. Chairman, on a number of issues we can see eye to eye on and saying we need to use this committee to open it, up, open it up, to be the watchdog committee that we are. Instead, we're wasting, we really sincerely are wasting the time of the American people doing this. This is awful for them to see us going back and forth like this. It's so disenchanting for them. And you all wonder why the, 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 the numbers out there of favorability towards Congress is so low. <laughs> they really have no faith in us because of this. This is the kind of stuff we do. When literally my folks are literally fighting for the right to breathe clean air and to, to fight, to sit there and figure out how they're gonna afford asthma inhalers. Yet we're here wasting the people's time. Will the gentlelady yield? Yes, Mr. Chair. And, and I, again, I say this out of somebody as a social worker at heart. We can do so many things in bipartisan in this committee. I know it. And I think we're right now really, waste, really missing out an opportunity to do that. We really are. Ms. Tlaib, I yield you, to Mr. Arrange. Well, it's for a question I just wanted to ask you, because you've had tremendous success in trying to clean up dirty water across America. We can actually get things done, right? A absolutely. And, you know, I know my colleague on the other side, we all have a crisis of the water, clean water crisis. We could, like, literally bring in folks in the EPA, bring folks into this chamber right now and ask, where is the Biden administration on the, on the development of their lead abatement uh, initiative? These are the things that I think very much many of my mayors, my local electeds, many of the state folks are asking, what can, they, what can we do as, as members of Congress to basically have more transparency in where the priorities are? But again, I really say this sincerely to all of you. We can do better. We deserve to do better. I remember Chairman Cummings constantly reminding us that we can be better. Gentlelady's time's expired. Before I recognize Representative Fry, for what purpose does uh, Representative McLean seek recognition? I'd like to enter something in the record. Um, my friends on the other side of the aisle are desperately trying to deflect from the Biden family are you going to peddling keep it the same scheme way? by attacking President Trump this, and his is this family. Her five minutes? Thank, I would thank like you. to enter into the record Just an article. Actually, Jared Kushner and Hunter Biden are nothing alike, and here are the facts. Thank without, you. Without objection, so ordered. Chair now recognizes uh, Representative Fry for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the inconsistencies that I've have kind of seen is what is on a text message, Mr. Bobulinski, with Raymond Zhao, and what Hunter Biden testified to in his own uh, deposition. And so this is infamous. We've talked about this a lot. Z, please have the director call me, not James, not you, or Jim. Have him call me tonight. I am sitting here with my father. We've talked about this a lot. We've, we've kind of got ad nauseum to it. And in response, Raymond Zhao says, copy, I will call you on WhatsApp. So in Hunter Biden's testimony on page 105, he, he states that the Zhao that he sent this to was not the Zhao that was connected to CEFC. What do you say about that, Mr. Bobulinski? Well, I think um, what he's simply saying is he made a mistake. Not that he meant to send that text message because it's crystal clear that that message was meant for Raymond Zhao who was the interpreter for Director Zhang at CFC, but I think he tried to obfuscate in his testimony that technically maybe he made a mistake and texted it to the wrong person. I can't speak to whether then he corrected that, but I do know based on the communications that he got on the phone with Raymond Zhao and set the record straight and exactly went through what he thought he was sending him in that message because it's followed up where they say, they sort of snap to and say, we'll cooperate with the family. Why were they willing to cooperate with the family? Because effectively they were bribing the Biden family to help get them to help them with the four unsealed indictments in the SDNY, which right. is the only thing that mattered to and, CS. And Raymond Zhao, you said he was an interpreter, but he was a little bit more than that too. He was like it? a chief of staff interpreter. Correct. Yeah. So he was he was kind of the handler for the CEFC business. Is yeah, that he correct? spoke good English. Director Zhang spoke very little English. Right, so to the extent that this was the wrong Zhao, I mean, I'm no rocket scientist, but if I get a text message and it's somebody that it, it, it's a different Russell, I'm going to say you've got the wrong guy, correct? 
Yeah, I believe Henry Zhao probably, his argument is he sent it to Henry Zhao. I'm assuming there's a text message somewhere where either Henry Zhao responded, hey, I think you meant that for somebody right. else. Or Instead, we just say, copy that. I'll call you on WhatsApp, right? Right, so yeah. if you were perplexed as to why you received a, a, a random text message that wasn't applied to Well, that's actually Raymond Zhao right? saying, I'll call you on that's WhatsApp. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the purpose, the, the issue that, 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 he, that he brings up, though, is that he was confused and it was the wrong Zhao. I want to ask you a couple more questions real quick. Hunter Biden's transcript on page 42, he said, I officially began to work for CEFC uh, when, the, when I received a retainer from CEFC in early or spring of 2017. Is that true? Well, it goes back to the word official. He's parsing words. Hunter Biden started working for CFC in the fall of 2015 and worked for CFC throughout 2016. That was confirmed to me by him, by James Gillier, by Rob Walker, numerous face-to-face -face conversations on it, right, numerous so this meetings. Is, so, so this is not true. On page 48 of his transcript, Hunter is asked, uh, he's never interacted with any of your business associates. Is that correct? The he's he's referring to is, is Joe Biden. Is that true? That's a lie. Hunter lied to the committee about important details concerning his money demands and threats to CEFC uh, based on this WhatsApp message right here. On page 105 of his testimony, Hunter states, quote, my father had no awareness, my father had no awareness of the business I was doing. Is that true? That's a lie. You also talked about how Jim Biden also uh, lied extensively throughout his own testimony um, and that Jim was selling plausible deniability for many years so that he could not tell the truth from a lie. On page 100 of Jim Biden's transcript, Jim has asked, do you recall having a meeting with Hunter Biden and Tony Bobulinski and Joe Biden? Jim's response was absolutely not. Uh, Jim states that Joe Biden never met with Tony Bobulinski. Is that true? That is a lie, and I'm shocked that his lawyer sitting next to him, a former U.S. attorney, allowed him to say that lie three different times in that transcribed interview. Right. When pressed, he continued to double down on that. He got excited. His lawyer had to calm him down, and he continued to lie about it. On page 124 of the transcript, Jim Biden states, quote, It was Hunter Biden, myself, Gilliar. I don't know. Uh, it was the five, okay? And, and everybody was 20 percent, okay? You know what? Uh, you know, it was never executed. It was never signed. And he's referring, of course, to the contract or the agreement. Is that true? That's a lie. He fully executed the uh, legal document, Oneida Holdings LLC, as did Hunter, James Gillier, Rob Walker, and myself. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, yours has been the consistent, uh, the consistent testimony throughout this process, unlike the other people who have come before this committee. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Very good. Chair now recognizes Ms. Presley from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when Elijah Cummings was the chair of this committee, he often reminded us that our role was to be in the efficient and effective pursuit of the truth. So I'm going to try to do exactly that because uh, this farce has gone 15 months, uh, 10,000 documents, and 11,000 hours uh, too long, and we've got a lot of ground to cover here. Uh, Mr. Partners, thank you for being here. Last year, you wrote a long letter to Chairman Comer detailing your extensive role in the, quote, campaign orchestrated by Giuliani and Trump to dig up dirt on the Bidens and to spread misinformation about them through various networks, including government officials, journalists, and Fox News personnel, unquote. When that campaign failed to find dirt because, well, there was no dirt to be found, the former occupant of the White House demanded that Ukrainian political officials announce investigations into the Biden family in order to smear Joe Biden prior to the 2020 presidential election. Uh, yes or no, Mr. Pronis, before Trump and Rudy Giuliani tasked you to try to find dirt on the Bidens in Ukraine, did you ever interact with Mr. Trump? Oh, before they asked me, yes, I've had many interactions. With okay. And you wrote to the committee that in late 2018 you attended a holiday party at Trump's White House, as shown in this picture. Can you describe your interactions with Donald Trump during this party? Uh, yes. Uh, we came to the event. It was a Hanukkah party. Uh, Rudy uh, Giuliani joined us. Uh, we were supposed to all go to the residence, but at the last second, Rudy said to wait for him downstairs. He was going to go meet Trump himself and update him on everything that was going on. Uh, he went to meet uh, Trump at the residence. Uh, we waited in the, w at the White House. Then eventually, when Trump came down to make a speech, Secret Service came up to us and said that the president wanted to wait, uh, to meet, see, wait for us at the Red Room. 
So we proceeded to the Red Room and waited for Trump to finish a speech. Then he came in, approached me, and basically told me, shook my hand and said, Rudy tells me great things. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And then we proceeded to take pictures. Mr. Parnas, when Trump told you to keep up the good work, what did you understand him to be referring to exactly? Well, at that point, the conversation was about Ukraine and Giuliani wanting me to go find Dr. Shokin. Uh, so that's what I took it as, as keep up the good work, uh, get, go get Victor Shokin on, on our way to Ukraine. And Mr. Parnas, after the party, did you interact with Trump again or were you cut off from, from interacting with him? Uh, after our trip to Ukraine, uh, we were cut off because uh, then the uh, BLT team was formed and the line of communication started going through Rudy Giuliani because they didn't want anybody to notice me with him because I was in Ukraine doing the stuff. I see. So is it fair to say, Mr. Parnas, um, that you think you were no longer invited to interact with Trump to create a buffer between President Trump and your work with Giuliani to generate evidence of Joe Biden's misconduct in Ukraine? Oh, I was told that. Not that I wasn't invited. I was told that you're, you're going to stop going to the route, to the events, to the private events and stuff like that, because while well, you're doing this. I see. So despite President Trump's efforts to insulate himself from associating with you as you sought evidence of Biden corruption in Ukraine, you maintained your contacts with individuals in Trump's innermost circle, including uh, Donald Trump Jr., correct? Absolutely, yes. Well, you know, as the saying goes, a leper can't change their spots. And so, Mr. Parnas, you're a prime example of Donald Trump's habit of welcoming people into his inner circle and then creating distance or the appearance of it from them as he relies on them to commit improper acts. Now Donald Trump has demanded that Joe Biden be impeached, has enlisted oversight Republicans to do his dirty work in an attempt to try to win the 2024 presidential election by promoting the same lies about President Biden, lies that are firmly rooted in Russia's disinformation and propaganda effort to influence U.S. elections and undermine Ukraine in the midst of a vicious Russian invasion. Um, I yield uh, to Mr. Goldman. Thank you very much, Ms. Presley. I want to get back to this uh, photograph here uh, that I got cut off from before. Um, <coughs> you, Mr. Bobulinski, have called, you called a number of people liars, six FBI agents. I did not the call this uh, as six FBI agents Sir, liars. I'm, I'm talking. Uh, if you go to page... Well, you know better, Mr. Goldman. Okay, go to page 174 of the transcript, and you said it's not an accurate statement. It's a lie related to an FBI report. I didn't call them Sorry, liars. I don't the have time. Be quiet. Now... This is a photo that was provided by Cassidy Hutchinson after you called her a liar when she said that you met with Mark Meadows and received an envelope. Do you see this photo? Do you acknowledge that is Mark Meadows in the red hat? Didn't you tell me to be quiet? I don't... <laughs> I, I asked a question. Do you acknowledge that that's Mark Meadows? I don't... In you, maybe your person can walk it closer so I can see it. Mr. Chairman, would you indulge just since he's I not mean, answering you're, the question? You're 15 he's filibustering? seconds over, but it, yeah, yeah. It, 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 well, let me thinking. just ask it very briefly Is that you and Mr. Meadows by Secret Service cars with you in a mask? Are, are you kidding, Mr. Goldman? I'm sitting 20 feet away go, from go, it. Go it's up to him, please. Right. Go right and, up to and him. And your, your time's expired. Okay. Maybe Mr. Swalwell could, could, will give could, you some time. Could he just answer the question? He, he can answer the question, so, right? So, what I see in this picture is a Secret Service agent five feet from me with a full mask on and a Secret Service agent sitting in a Cadillac Escalade with all the windows up with a full mask on. Is that so you're you making it talking a big to deal. the person in the red hat? Um, it's the back of his head. I don't... Is that ta you talking to the person in the red hat? Why don't you ask me this, hat? Mr. Goldman? Did I meet Mr. Meadows at a Trump Answer rally in Rome, Georgia? I did. I acknowledge is that. Is it you? Mr. Oh, you Mr. Goldman. I did. Mr. Oh, Goldman, I, I did. Uh, But Cassidy um, Hutchinson is a liar. Cassidy Hutchinson's a liar because she said expired. that he handed me an envelope. Mr. Meadows didn't give me a single thing. Now... Chair recognizes. Glad we have the clear no, story. No, no, your, your time's expired. Maybe Mr. Swalwell will yield you some time. Chair now recognizes Mr. Langworthy from Buffalo for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Glad it's so quiet in here. Uh, on the first day of the Biden presidency, then Press Secretary Jen Psaki claimed that President Biden's objective and his commitment was to bring, quote, transparency and truth back to government, to share the truth even when it's hard to hear. Uh, that is obviously laughable, just about as laughable as when Hunter Biden claimed that he was trying to avoid wire fees 
when he had Rob Walker launder a $1 million payment from a Chinese company through 16 different bank wires to Hunter Halley in Jim Biden's accounts. If you're trying to avoid wire fees, then why send four different wires over three months to the same account? It's a total joke. A glaring example of President Biden's failure to live up to his promise to bring transparency is his influence peddling in Ukraine, where he pressured the Ukrainian government to fire Prosecutor General Viktor Shokin, who was investigating the owner of Burisma. While Joe Biden was vice president in 2014, his son Hunter Biden was asked by Burisma's owners to join the board, a paid position. The committee has sought documents from the administration regarding Vice President Biden's influence peddling in the Ukraine. The administration, which claims transparency, has failed to produce these documents. I'll give you an example. On September of 2015, the United States was steadfast in its belief that the owner of Burisma was the face of corruption in Ukraine. The administration vowed to work with the prosecutor general to tackle corruption in the country. However, that all changed after a phone call from Hunter Biden and the owner of Burisma to Hunter's Washington, D.C. associates in 2015. A few day la days later, Vice President Biden delivered a speech to the Ukrainian legislature and privately pressured the Ukrainian president to fire the prosecutor general. The Oversight Committee has asked the White House for drafts of Vice President Biden's speech to the Ukrainian legislature from 2015. They have withheld those draft speeches for nearly seven months. To this date, we have not been able to review them. We all want to know whether there were edits to the speech after Hunter called D.C. We all want to know whether the vice president, then vice president, changed course to protect his son and his corrupt business associates. We all want to know whether the Biden family's business dealings affected American policy towards the Ukraine. The White House claims to be committed to bringing truth and transparency to government. It just seems like it's only interested when it's convenient for his administration. Now, Mr. Bobolinsky, did Hunter ever tell you at any point the value of the Burisma income to him? No, I was not involved in the business. I don't recall him ever mentioning that to me. Okay, did he ever say it was his only income at that time? Oh, okay. Actually, I stand corrected. There's a... There, <laughs> There's a text message. I never discussed it with him. I was in Monaco at the Grand Prix. He was in Monaco for the Burisma board meeting. He set up a meeting with me. He didn't show up at that meeting. Obviously, you can imagine I wasn't too happy. And he responded to a text me asking him what's going on. And in that text, he states he's on the back of Cola's yacht fighting for the only income he has. But it wasn't from Burisma. It was from the Kazakh deal that he's talking about. I never discussed that with him after that. That was a single exchange between him and I. No. Corruption and a lack of transparency from the Biden family have been common themes through the House Oversight Committee's investigation. And even when asking for simple drafts of then Vice President Biden's speech in the Ukraine, the White House has been anything but transparent. President Biden has done and will continue to do everything in his power to cover up the truth, especially when it's hard to hear. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The uh, uh Gentleman yields back. Mr. Bobolinsky uh, yields back to me for one minute. Is there anything that you want to uh, respond to? No, you don't worry about Mr. Goldman. We don't pay any attention to Mr. Goldman either. But uh, is there anything that anyone said up here that you want to take about uh, 55 seconds to respond to? Um, it's tempting. I mean, my biggest uh, appeal to everyone in this room is I wish you would spend the time focusing on the fact that the Chinese Communist Party infiltrated the White House of the United States of America through the Biden family. I don't say that lightly. It's not a joke. I was willing to die for this country, as was my father and both my grandfathers and my brother. This is serious, serious stuff. We should be asking how that happened. Take the Biden name and the Biden family completely out of it. How did the Chinese Communist Party infiltrate the White House of exactly. the United States of America? Let's start there, focus on those facts, what they did, how they did it, why they used money, why they used private enterprises instead of military stuff and other stuff. That is huge to our national security. So I appreciate you yielding that time to me, Mr. Chairman. Well, well thank you. And I'll just say this. Mr. Tlaib and Ms. Uh, uh, Presley criticized the investigation, but I think most Americans care about public corruption. And they realize the FBI hasn't done the job, that DOJ hasn't done their job, the IRS hasn't done their job. They've been told to stand down. All that's left is the House Oversight Committee, and we will do our job. 
and pursuant to the previous order, because votes have been called again, the committee stands in recess subject to the call of the chair. The committee will reconvene five minutes after floor votes. Reconvene, the chair recognizes Mr. Swalwell for five minutes. Mr. Bobulinski, um, in your interactions with the Biden family, which you've told us uh, all about uh, throughout the day, did you ever observe the Chinese government grant 22 patents to any of Joe Biden's children while Joe Biden was in office? I did not. Did you ever observe the Chinese government, um, I'm sorry, did you ever observe Joe Biden ever own or operate any hotels while he was in public office and take millions of dollars from foreign governments? I did not. Did you ever observe Joe Biden employ any of his children or their spouses in the White House as vice president or president? I, I did not. I can't speak to that. Did you ever observe, while observing the Bidens, uh, the Bidens install a family member to be the co-chair of the DNC? I'm sorry, ask the question again? Did you ever observe the Bidens install a family member to be the co-chair of the Democratic National Committee? Uh, I did not. Did President Biden or anyone in his family take $2 billion from the Saudi government? Not that I'm aware of. Did President Biden or anyone in his family uh, get fined $355 million for tax fraud? Um, not that I'm aware of. Mr. Parnas, as you've observed uh, Mr. Bobulinski today and, and his fealty and dedication and loyalty to the Trump family, is that something you recognize as somebody who was also in that cult before? Absolutely. Is there, is there hope for our man, Tony, here? Uh, very little, I think, until he hits a brick wall. And in your experience, on a scale of 1 to 10, how eager was the Trump campaign in your interactions to manufacture dirt on Joe Biden? 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. 10 plus. 10 plus. Would it surprise you, Mr. Parnas, that the Russians and in their disinformation campaign outlets have often cited Chairman Comer's uh, testimony and allegations against the Biden family to make their own allegations against Joe Biden. No, it doesn't surprise me because that's exactly what they want to happen. Mr. Chairman, it's over. It's over. It's time to pack it up. And I want to give you the top 10 reasons why impeachment is dead. Number 10. Your key witness today is testifying from the slammer. Number nine, key evidence of a bribe that you all relied on. The guy who said that has been indicted for lying about that bribe, and he's a Russian asset. Number eight, another key witness has been indicted as a Chinese agent. Number seven, during the Hunter Biden interview, Mr. Chairman, you didn't even stay for the whole time. Number six, Chairman Jason Smith didn't show up at all to the Hunter Biden interview. The same day, number five, Daryl Issa said, it's a big nothing. Number four, today Jim Jordan began his remarks, not by relying on any evidence for this investigation, but he went off attacking the DOJ about what they're doing with the Catholics. Number three, you all still have not sent the articles of impeachment for the Mayorkas impeachment to the Senate. And that happened last month. Number two, you're now talking about a criminal referral, but if you had evidence for a criminal referral, then you have evidence to impeach somebody for high crimes and misdemeanors. And number one, and I'm sorry to say this, Fox News isn't even carrying this today. In fact, one of their anchors, as they broke away 10 minutes in, said, this is the same hearing over and over and over. At what point are you gonna fish or cut bait? So I just have to tell you, it's over. Impeachment's over. Dunzo. Bye-bye. Rigor mortis. Lights out. Curtain drop. Mic drop. Peace. Adios. Sayonara. Au revoir. Or a language that you all understand. Doi siv danya. Did I say that right, Mr. Parnas? Yes. <laughs> I dare you to impeach. But you won't because you don't have the evidence. And because you don't have the evidence, you don't have the votes. Guys, it's dead. And so I'm here to pronounce the time of death. Five sixteen. Say it in Chinese. Impeachment is dead. Five sixteen. Biden impeachment's dead. Joe Biden has been acquitted.
Gentlemen, time's expired. Chair now recognizes Ms. Luna from Florida for five minutes. Mr. Parnas, I want to read to you a few quotes from a letter that you wrote to the House Oversight Committee. First, you said that I will remind you that Solcheski's answers are in the report that the House Oversight Committee published. In this document, he stated that Hunter Biden was never asked or assigned to speak with anyone in the U.S. on behalf of Burisma. Mr. Parnas, are you aware that according to Amos uh, Hochstein, a U.S. Senate, uh, U.S. State Department official, in a transcribed interview with the Senate, Hunter Biden requested to have a meeting with him in November of 2015. Mr. Hoxie testified that he met with Hunter Biden and they spoke about Burisma. So yes or no, that statement that you made to House Oversight was incorrect. The statement was correct because that's the Yes or no? The statement is coming so from the yes, words of was? CEO Burisma. It's directly con this was conflicting his answer. with testimony. Not, Next question. The, rep, that was not there my were no answer. political or lobbying firm efforts Burisma. on behalf of Burisma in your statement that you made to House Oversight. Mr. Parnas, are you aware that Burisma's engagement of Blue Star Strategies, which was a lobbying firm that was a lobbying the U.S. government on behalf of Burisma and Mikola Slocheski, and according to Sally Painter and Karen Termitano, the heads of Burisma. So that statement, again, that you wrote to this committee was incorrect, yes or no? no. No, you're incorrect because no, I said no. No, that is incorrect. No, the, you're directly no, conflicting no, with that. No, My final no, question quest, for you, no, Mr. Parnas, is by, next you wrote me, that nobody from CEO the company of Burisma has thing. ever spoken to Joe Biden. It's okay, Chairman. I got him. Mr. Parnas, <laughs> Devin Archer testified to this committee that Vadim Pacharsky, the corporate secretary of Burisma, sat down for dinner with Joe Biden. So that statement also was incorrect that you wrote to this committee. Yes or no? No, it's not incorrect. Mr. Chairman, I think this witness's credibility is shot. I'd like to. <laughs> I'd like to give the remaining of my time to the amazing chair, uh, representative from Florida, Representative Matt Gates. Very good. The Democrats could have sent anyone. They could have sent Hunter Biden. They could have sent Joe Biden. They could have sent Rob Walker. They could have sent Devin Archer. The Democrats could have sought any person to come and refute the direct evidence backed up by bank statements, backed up by calendar entries, backed up by emails, backed up by text messages. And who did the Democrats send? to clear the name of Joe and Hunter Biden. They sent Lev Parnas. Lev Parnas, who was charged with enough crimes and violating our campaign finance laws to like serve 50 years, but he gets four months. And, and like the, the, the big like grand criminal conspiracy Mr. Parnas is involved in is using Russian oligarch money to try to get marijuana licenses, which seems odd, and then using that Russian money to plow into campaigns in order to achieve that objective. But the fraud he committed wasn't just on our election system by plowing Russian money, it was also a fraud on his own investors who didn't get it. So I guess, Mr. Bobulinski, as you hear uh, Maxwell Frost, my colleague on the Democrat side, say that Mr. Parnas, fresh off of his prison time, is the most credible witness we've had to address these business dealings. What's your reaction to that? I think it's laughable that uh, the Democrats are asking Lev Parnas to weigh in on my credibility, a convicted felon that served jail time. I have an impeccable record. Now, he warned me earlier in this hearing that they're coming for me. I look no, forward I didn't worry. to that. I said just keep talking. I, You'll I be look, there soon. I look forward to that, Mr. Parnas. Keep lying. You'll be there soon. Well, and, and is that, when it, is that a threat, yeah, Mr. Parnas? No, it's just the truth. If no, did you, you say they I were coming that. for me? <laughs> no, I said if you keep lying, you will end up in prison. I'm not lying. You're well, the one who was not, lying. You have nothing to say. You're the one who went to prison for lying. What am I lying? lying for? Tell me what we're lying for, Mr. Baberensky. What? You don't even know what you're talking about. What am I lying? You went to what prison lying? for lying and defrauding no, no, your what investors. What am I lying here? What am I lying here? Oh, the list is the long. We don't have enough time. I think Mr. Gates only has a minute. I think you're a little scared, just like Mr. Gates. So one Because Mr. Gates doesn't even ask a question. You're filibustering. I've been here for six hours and not one of your committee members had asked me one question. You want to well, hear I the truth? You, hold on, no, hold on, yeah, that, no, no, you I asked ask a, question a question about your illegal business I've been dealing. here for seven hours. Mr. Bob ask me some questions. Fraud is a Stop crime, right? Go ahead. Ask Correct. Me. Fraud is a crime. Fraud is a crime, and you observed fraud on the part of the Bidens, right? I did, crystal clear. So much so, I had an independent law firm spend $300,000 to analyze that fraud and put together a fully ready, fiable lawsuit against the Biden family. Family. And bribery is a crime, right? Correct. And what you observed with Joe Biden trying to get you into this business deal with Hunter Biden, what you later learned about that business deal and how the money was flowing from the Chinese Communist Party to Hunter Biden, to other members of the Biden family, uh, did, did that concern you as a potential feature of money laundering? It did. It did. I started to grow concerned uh, after I met Joe Biden 
and then I sat down with Jim Biden and he used the term plausible deniability with me, and that's documented because I went back to my lawyers and I asked them, something doesn't, is starting to feel unright, and they went and hired another law firm to give me a full FCPA workup to go through the details of what could be done and what couldn't be done. Sounds like high crimes and misdemeanors to me, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Very good. Chair now recognizes uh, the chairwoman of the House Education Committee, Ms. Fox from North Carolina. Dr. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I want to thank my colleagues for what you have been doing here today, unraveling these um, issues. Mr. Galinas, in your written testimony, you state that your, quote, objective was to build a diversified private equity platform which would be anchored by a globally known Wall Street brand together with a globally known political name, Biden, end quote. Is it correct that Harvest Fund Management, a $300 billion Chinese financial services company closely connected to the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, was interested in partnering with you and your business partners? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Why was the CCP connected Harvest Fund Management interested in doing business with you and your partners, Hunter Biden and Devin Archer? The, the only plausible reason, and the reason we even discussed, was, was because of the um, access that it provided. There was a, a quote that was attributed to, to uh, uh, Henry Zhao, the chairman, that talked about the access that it provided. So there's, there's documentation that was uh, contemporaneous that, that said what their interest was, and that interest was political access. Thank you. Is it correct that Harvest Fund Management believed that Joe Biden would take a seat on that company's board after his vice presidency ended? Yes, that's correct. And there were emails to that effect around that time that, that were circulated by people who were there as part of those conversations, including the golf outing. Thank you. Are you aware of Hunter Biden ever speaking to his father, Joe Biden, about the plan to have him join the board of Harvest Fund Management? Yes, I, I witnessed that, yes. It seems clear that Joe Biden was aware of his family's use of his office and influence to do business with America's adversaries and therefore a choice to pursue personal gain over national security. Mr. Bobolinsky, is it true that former Vice President Joe Biden met with Xi Jinping, the chairman of CEFC China Energy? Uh, it is based on Rob Walker saying yes to that in a transcribed interview. I personally was not at that meeting. When did this meeting take place based on what Mr. Walker said? Yeah, in my understanding, it would have been February 2017. After they had a meeting in Miami, um, I believe James Gilliard got on the corporate jet of CFC and flew with Yi Jianming and Director Zhang to DC in preparation for that meeting. After this meeting with former Vice President Joe Biden and Chairman Yi, were any payments made to the Biden family or associates? Yes, well, it gets to that point of obfuscation. $3 million was wired to Rob Walker's account on March 1st. Actually, they sent two wires. The first wire got kicked back, and then they sent a second wire on March 1st, 2017, to Robinson Walker LLC. And then as your committees walk through today, they parsed that out to the Biden family in numerous different payments. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, it is clear that Joe Biden is the common element in all of Hunter Biden's attempts to do business with China. There's a pattern emerging that the Biden family and associates, including Joe Biden himself, deliberately chose personal gain over the safety and best interest of the very Americans Joe Biden was elected to serve, protect, and defend. With that, I'll yield the balance of my time to Mr. Gates. Hunter Biden's deposition. Question. Do you think some of your business associates we've spoken about today, Mr. Archer, Mr. Bobulinski, Mr. Galanis, do you think they had an expectation that your dad had any role or involvement in any of your joint business dealings? Answer from Hunter Biden, not an expectation from me. There was never a single time I can remember saying, hey, we'll get my dad involved. Hey, let's get my dad on the phone. Hey, let's, you know, what can we get out of dad for this? Mr. Galanis, what's your reaction to that testimony from Hunter Biden in light of you describing the Biden lift? I think it, it, 
it's patently false. It's belied by by emails, and and uh, I think that there's documentation that says that that's just an untruthful statement. And what I what I'm trying to understand, Mr. Galanis, is there you are sitting in a prison cell for a financial crime where you were an associate with Hunter Biden and some of the other players there, and they're out enjoying Southern California, and you're sitting in a prison cell, and they've got the ability to come and give this false testimony to Congress. Is it, is it your belief that the Biden Justice Department uh, retaliates against people who speak out against the Bidens and their crimes? I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm living that. I think, uh, to clarify, I took responsibility for my crimes. I pleaded guilty. I've served eight years of clean conduct, and, and I think I've rehabilitated myself quite a bit in that, that period of time, and evidence, a track record. But I would say that there is unquestionably a, a, a pattern of two tiers of justice, and that's become a popularized term, and it's something that I've a, a, a lived experience that I've gone through. Yield back. Before I recognize Mr. Waltz, uh, for what purpose does Mr. Big seek recognition? I want to include a re uh, an article in a record. The article is entitled, Talib renews her, quote, impeach the mf -er, close quote, call against Trump. Without objection to order, for what purpose does Mr. Gates seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record. The uh, press release from the Department of Justice, Lev Parna is sentenced to 20 months in prison for campaign finance, wire fraud, and false statement offenses. With, without objection, so ordered. Chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I find it uh, incredibly rich. Mr. Swalwell is going to come to this committee and lecture us about how China penetrates our government. I think that's something he <laughs> may know a thing or two about. But let's, let's talk about how China has penetrated the highest levels uh, of this government, including this president and, and this White House, because I think the visual uh, is, is incredibly important. Um, Mr. Bobulinski, Hunter Biden portrayed Chairman Yi, the chairman of CEFC, uh, to Jim Biden as a protege of Xi. Is that accurate? Not only is it accurate, and it wasn't just Hunter Biden, it was James Gillier, Rob Walker. I wouldn't have used the word protege. They just basically, you know. You don't run China's largest state-owned energy company without being close to Chairman Correct. Xi. Correct. Right, fair enough. Uh, and by the mid-2000s, uh, Chairman Ye ran a, a business empire estimated, as much as you can estimate a Chinese state-owned enterprise, tens of billions, including and from a national security standpoint, this is the, the critical piece here, including implementing China's Belt and Road Initiative, not just all over the world, right here in the United States. Is that accurate? A hundred percent. So CFC was effectively the shadow arm of the Chinese government deploying tens of billions of dollars around the world, very well documented. At its peak, I think it was doing $50 billion of revenue per year, one of the top five largest... Debt diplomacy, companies. where they are taking electrical grids, they are bribing officials, uh, they take as collateral, uh, not just grids, ports, airports, key infrastructure that the Chinese government could then leverage and use against uh, any country, but also here in the United States. I mean, that's how the Belt and Road Initiative works. Heck, I was just in the Armed Services Committee with a commander of Indo-PACOM, uh, our Pacific Command, talking about how China is basically gobbling up uh, infrastructure around the world, including here. Uh, so by the, by the mid, what, 2015, 2016, Hunter Biden's developed a very lucrative business relationship. By 2017, Hunter Biden's forged such a partnership with Chairman Ye that he planned to share an office space with him and then just removed Vice President uh, Biden at the House of Sweden in Washington, D.C., correct? Correct. So here's what's interesting. And building on Chairman Fox's uh, questions, within days of him leaving the vice presidency, ostensibly for work performed, $3 million flows through these shell companies that we've depicted here. I mean, you could see how complicated this is, but the key piece is the flow to Hallie Biden, to Jim and Sarah Biden, to Hunter Biden and his various affiliates. And the kicker here, Mr. Chairman, is that we know Hunter is then complaining about paying all his dad's bills. He's complaining to the other relatives saying, you freeloaders, I'm having to use all this money 
to pay the big guy's bills, house renovations and all kinds of things, correct? Correct, I mean, and it's important for the American people to understand the $3 million was three of $20 million that the Bidens expected to be paid for the work in 2015 and 2016. Mr. Chairman. And that's not just my word, that is documented. That's all documented, numerous. bank records, text messages, emails. Mr. Chairman, Bob Menendez's wife can't get paid by the Egyptians and then provide that money over to pay Golbar Bob's, uh, uh, Senator Menendez's bills. I can't have my daughter get paid by, I don't know, Kazakhstan, Russia, and China, and then pay my bills. Sure. Uh, and we know also that they had commingled funds with the Vice President of the United States. So when we talk about crimes, let's talk about the crimes. We know he perjured himself. That's a crime. We know he was acting as a foreign agent. And he, was he registered under FARA? Was he registered as a foreign agent? Not that was I'm Hunter, aware of. Was his dad complicit in him acting as a foreign agent through meetings and dinners and what have you? That's 100%. crime. A hundred percent. That's crime number two. He was clearly acting uh, in that capacity. We have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And we already have him, thanks to the work of this committee, for tax evasion. So, Mr. Chairman, there are multiple crimes that this committee has established ample evidence we must move uh, to impeachment. We cannot allow this to stand. Uh, and I look forward to seeing those references to the Department of Justices. For this alone, this is a critical national security issue. The Chinese Communist Party call it the princelings. They don't go after the principle they want to influence. They go through the sun. And it is right out of their playbook. And they've done it at the highest levels of the United States government. I yield my time. Very good. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have a, a couple of... Uh you see requests of that's all right. Proceed. One is from Devin Archer's uh, transcribed interview testifying that Biden, Joe Biden had nothing to do with any of Devin Archer's business ventures with Hunter. Second is um, uh, the declassified intelligence community assessment from the National Intelligence Council, March 2021, detailing efforts by Russian actors to interfere in the 2020 US elections. And finally, most importantly, the U.S. District Court decision from the Southern District of New York in the United States versus Galanis, um, where uh, Mr. Galanis was described as a con artist who wanted to be in business with Hunter Biden but never was, and how they thought that um, they could add layers of legitimacy to their con operation. If I could have those introduced. Without objection, so ordered. Now the chair recognizes Mr. Gates from Florida. You're a serious business person, Mr. Bobulinski, right? I am. Uh, unlike the convicted felon next to you, you've served in the military, right? Correct. You've done big deals. Correct. Complicated deals, deals that involved foreign businesses, right? C correct. And so what I'm trying to figure out is when you came to realize that you showed up at the wrong party, because you kind of strike me as a guy who showed up to do a legitimate business deal, and you ended up instead at a bribe. And so as you're looking at CEFC, as you're having this meeting with Joe Biden, as Hunter Biden is introducing you to his web of contacts, when did you go from serious businessman Tony Bobulinski working to make a buck in a capitalist system to a guy worried that you had been unwittingly ensnared into Hunter and Joe Biden's bribe operation with the Chinese Communist Party? I appreciate the question. It wasn't an aha moment, it was more of a process. I am a serious businessman, demonstrated by the different deals I've done around the world and uh, the success of them. But it started, remember, the Biden family wasn't my entry into this. James Gillier, who I'd known for over 10 years, who traveled the world doing business, kept trying to get me involved. I really had no interest, no interest. I got, I sat down in the spring of 2017 to walk through things, and then I quickly put together two businesses, Sinohawk and Oneida. After the meetings in Los Angeles with Hunter and Joe Biden, it started to sort of, bells and whistles started to go off when Jim Biden used the term plausible deniability. Plausible okay. deniability is the first moment, straight from the lips of Jim Biden, right on the heels of your discussion with Joe Biden, where you start to think, this might not be legit. Correct, and my lawyers at the time could attest to that because I reached out to them saying, Listen, I'm a former naval officer. I held a Q security clearance. I couldn't collect, somebody couldn't take me to dinner for $50.
This just does not make sense to me. But and you they, proceed. But you proceed, and then later this thing starts to get a lot u uglier. What's the moment you go from, okay, your spidey senses are up, you're analyzing this, to now you know this is a crime that you are bearing witness to? The end of July, when the Biden family put them right front and center in the middle of a $9 billion transaction between the Russian state-owned energy company Rosneft and CFC, a surrogate for the Chinese Communist Party. And was there ever a time in the deals you were involved in where you started to see the money move around the legitimate business enterprise and toward the pockets of the Bidens? Well, the challenge, Mr. Gates, with that is at the time they moved the money, right? You guys have the text messages where Hunter Biden shook down Director Zhang, but I was not aware of that. I spent a year asking questions of, this doesn't make sense to me. Where's the money? I, I stepped in and had lawyers work to dissolve the two entities. I didn't know till years later that they had defrauded me, they had gotten paid all this money and um, all this craziness. The amount yeah, it, of fact, it just seems pretty I, simple. This is either a bribe or a business. It was a bribe from the Chinese Communist Party. And, you, and, and, and I don't say that lightly. There's 1,200 pages eight days of testimony in the Southern District of New York. I encourage everyone watching me, hearing me say this, they're publicly available, go read them. Our Department of Justice outlines in intimate detail the corruption and bribes that CFC was deploying to political officials all over the world. It wasn't so just I'm here United to States. believe that they did this in every other country, but with the Biden family, it was pristine. It was an actual clean business. That's absurd. And you, and you came to know that, and that's when you blew the whistle, right? That's when you started to get, to get worried, when you saw Joe I Biden. I stepped away from it. There, yeah. There's the whistleblowers. I can't give them kudos enough for the bravery and the risk they put their family in. They published stuff where I am voicing the concern of the Rosneft deal. And you animated your concerns when you saw that this wasn't just a corrupt bribe, a corrupt business deal happening to a guy who used to be vice president. When you see that Joe, everyone's made a big deal like you're a bad guy that you showed up at the debate or you're trying to give life to these facts that you've observed, that it's so bad that you did that during a political contest. But observing this, it kind of seems like it would be unpatriotic for you to stay quiet. Of course. And so, I mean, Joe Biden running for president clearly motivated the Chinese yeah. to consummate this bribe. Did it also motivate you? Well, I didn't want to go public. I wanted to simply unload all the facts, personal experiences. It's funny, there's 18 people on this committee with law degrees, including, I think, Mr. Swalwell. Evidence, firsthand testimony, is the most powerful evidence you have. I've given it, Mr. Galanis has given it, along with a whole host of other witnesses. Then, on top of that, I have thousands of documents and pages of, of legals and stuff well, like that, that. That's what's interesting, I wanted Mr. to simply Bobby give this information. Yeah, Congress and thing. senators. No one questioned any of your facts. Yeah. No one brought a single piece of evidence that, in, that even for a moment discredited any of the truthful testimony that you've given us. No, I see they my did time's not. expired. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, that concludes our questioning. Uh, again, want to thank the witnesses. Uh, we are going to close now, and I will yield to the ranking member for a brief closing statement. Great, and I'll take an extra 32 seconds, as Mr. Gates did. Um, well, and, and while we're on Mr. Gates, he seemed to be upset about a couple different things. One was fraud, which was fascinating to me, uh, given that his hero, Donald Trump, has just been convicted civilly of bank and insurance fraud in New York uh, in a civil case, and now owes, I think it's $454 million, unless that's gone up. Uh, with interest. I think he's having a hard time uh, making that, but I'm sure that the, uh, Mr. Gates's constituents will help him out as they're shaking down Republican voters. You can pay either for Donald Trump's criminal lawyers or his civil lawyers. That's the big political choice, I suppose. Uh, he's also upset about China. Well, if you check out the Democrats' report, White House for Sale, how princes, prime ministers, and premiers paid off President Trump, you'll find that China actually gave more than $5 million to Donald Trump while he was president of the United States in direct violation of the emoluments clause, which says that nobody in federal office shall accept a present and emolument, which means a payment, an officer title of any kind, whatever, from a king, a prince, or a foreign state. And we spent the day, again, jawboning about Hunter Biden, who has never held public office, and he's never done business with the government. And yet we have right in front of us, in front of our very eyes, 
uh, mammoth corruption, unprecedented U.S. history by Donald Trump as president. And my friends don't say a single uh, word about it, but he wants to lecture Mr. Parnas about the illegal donations he made on behalf of pro-Trump super PACs. I've noticed something interesting with the people who have finally disenthralled themselves and gotten out of the Trump cult, as Mr. Parnas puts it. People like Michael Cohen, Sarah Matthews, Cassidy Hutchinson, Alyssa Griffin. There's articles about them. There are dozens of those people, and I'd be fleeing for the exits now, too. Um, what, what's so fascinating to me about it is that they don't mind when these people lie for Donald Trump. Then when they get out and start telling the truth, that's when they call them liars for what they did when they worked for Donald Trump. Mr. Parnas, they're not mad that you lied and went to prison for it and did your time. They're mad that you stopped lying for Donald Trump. Absolutely, Congressman Raskin. So when I was a state assistant attorney general, Mr. Chairman, I saw a judge on my very first day of work castigate a lawyer by saying, son, you forgot the very first rule of lawyering. When you go to court, you got to bring the evidence with you. You forgot to bring the evidence. There's no evidence. Hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, dozens of hours of testimony, but not a shred of evidence of presidential wrongdoing, much less an impeachable offense by President Biden. And you're making not just the majority a laughing stock, the whole committee a laughing stock. So it's hurting us. My members are saying, when will they call off this nonsense? So here we are. Again, Mr. Parnas, I want to thank you. You have explained to America that the allegations at the very foundation of this inquiry were predicated on Russian propaganda and disinformation, just as they were at the start of the hit job that you and Rudy Giuliani were sent to do back in 2018 and 19. And I want to thank you for showing America what real intellectual honesty and personal honesty look like and how you can grow out of the deranged Trump syndrome that so many of our colleagues are still suffering from today. It's time to call this investigation for what it is, Mr. Chairman. It's not just an embarrassing failure and an historic failure at that, but it's an historic betrayal of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law as Vladimir Putin tramples the freedoms and the democracy of people in Ukraine. We should be spending our time standing up for democracy and not tarnishing it with spectacles like this. I yield back. I should have brought my waiters from the farm. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for, for being here today. Mr. Bobolisky, Mr. Galanis have delivered testimony in front of the American people directly implicating President Biden and his family's influence peddling schemes. Schemes that brought over $24 million into the Biden family and their business associates' pockets. For what? I never heard the minority say what they did or what business the Bidens were in. Mr. Bobolinsky and Mr. Galanis have provided documents supporting these claims and provided hours of testimony to this committee. Mr. Bobolinsky and Mr. Galanis have not changed their stories. Mr. Bobolinsky and Mr. Galanis did not ask for this hearing, but they showed up for it because they have nothing to hide. I also invited Hunter Biden to this hearing in part due to his own request that he be allowed to provide transparency and testimony before the American people. Or at least he did request this hearing, and then he sat for a deposition with the Oversight and Judiciary Committees. Now he's nowhere to be found. Mr. Bobolinsky, Mr. Galanis, and others have implicated Joe Biden in the Biden family business. Hunter Biden denies his father's role in the Biden family business. This is a material discrepancy among witnesses of the highest order. I attempted to solve this problem by getting the witnesses in the same room together to straighten out any misunderstandings. It should be clear to the American people that Hunter Biden's word is as valuable as the fake services he was selling. And this committee will not play games or belittle the institution of Congress by allowing Hunter Biden to call the shots about who he testifies with or when he does it. At this point, the only person who can resolve this discrepancy about Joe Biden's participation in his family's influence peddling schemes is Joe Biden himself. As I said at the beginning of this hearing, Joe Biden was either used by his family over and over again and paraded in front of his business partners to rake in millions of dollars, or he knew exactly what he was doing 
to enrich his family. Joe Biden was either complicit or incompetent. And the American people deserve to know which one it is, which one it was. But neither is acceptable for the leader of the United States. I don't think anyone believes that this is acceptable behavior for the family of the president of the United States to receive tens of millions of dollars from our adversaries around the world. And they can't say one single thing they did to receive the money. Nobody supports that. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, if you're from a big city or a small town. That's not what this democracy is about. That's not what uh, the founding fathers set up. They set this up that we have public servants come and, and provide their public service and then go on. They did not set this up for public servants to enrich themselves through their family, through influence peddling. No one is denied. Is anyone denying, Mr. Raskin, that the Biden family was influence peddling? Nobody denies that the family was influence peddling. What we, what we have here is a major discrepancy on what role Joe Biden played. We know the three former Biden associates say that Joe Biden was actively involved and knew full well what the schemes were, what the family was up to. But we have Hunter Biden testifying under oath that his dad didn't know. So in the coming days, I will invite President Biden to the Oversight Committee to provide his testimony and explain why his family received tens of millions of dollars from foreign companies with his assistance. We need to hear from the president himself. And I assure the American people that they will be able to evaluate for themselves the president's honesty and fitness for the office he now holds. With that. Mr. Chairman, are you going to invite Donald Trump to come and talk about his violations of the emoluments clause? You all have investigated Donald Trump for years, and I'm pretty sure I've read in the paper that there's a lot of investigations of Donald Trump. No one's investigated well, we Joe impeached Biden. him. You were invited to impeach uh, Joe are you, Biden are today. Are you supporting, uh, are you going to work with me to see that uh, Joe Biden comes and answers these discrepancies? I mean, this is a big deal. There, there's no discrepancies. There's not no been, discrepancies. No, there's, there's no evidence at all that he's committed any high crime and misdemeanor. What is it? In closing, I want to thank our panelists once again for their important and insightful testimony today. Uh, with that and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit materials and to submit additional written questions for the witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. If there is no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned. We will come to order. I want to welcome everyone here this morning. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess at any time. Without objection. Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Jason Smith of Missouri, Representative Matt Gates of Florida, and Representative Eric Swalwell from California are waived onto the committee for the purpose of questioning the witnesses at today's committee hearing. For today's hearing, opening statements will be limited to 10 minutes for the chair and 10 minutes for the ranking member. The chair also notes that points of order pertaining to the engaging of personalities against the president will not be in order for the duration of today's hearing. Given that this is a hearing regarding this committee's impeachment inquiry, members must be allowed to speak frankly. The chair now recognizes himself for an opening statement. Today, the House Committee on Oversight will hear from witnesses who have previously provided information during our deposition and interview phase regarding the Biden family's business practices in China, Ukraine, Russia, and other places around the world. At the start of this Congress, the Oversight Committee has investigated what product or service the Biden family and their associates were selling that would justify over $24 million in payments. We've reviewed emails, bank records, text messages, suspicious activity reports at Treasury, and other evidence normally compiled during an expansive investigation such as this. The Oversight Committee has found no credible evidence 
of the Bidens providing any work product. The committee has identified no legitimate value or document or even one single hour of work the Bidens have provided their business partners. Nothing. What is apparent after over a year of investigation is that the Bidens do not work in any traditional sense of the word. They do not work as consultants or lawyers or advisors. The Bidens don't sell a product or service or a set of skills. The Bidens sell Joe Biden. That is their business. For months, we have heard Democrats desperately proclaiming that witnesses have told this committee that Joe Biden had no involvement in his family's business dealings. But where are those witnesses today? It's telling. Democrats haven't invited one of these witnesses to today's hearing. That's because they know their testimonies would not withstand public scrutiny. Democrats have relied on these witnesses' opening statements and have willfully turned a blind eye to the facts that have come out of in these interviews once the witnesses were questioned about our record of evidence. Democrats now must rely on bringing in a distraction witness to talk about nonsense. And who can't talk about any of the facts brought by today's witnesses who worked with the Bidens? Now, President Biden cannot control his adult son. He cannot control his brother, his sister-in-law, or his nine family members who have received money from these transactions. All President Biden can do is control his own actions. And that is what we are here today to discuss with the witnesses. Because in the course of this investigation, we have learned that Joe Biden has taken action after action to further his family's plans to get rich. He shows up to meetings, gets on phone calls, shakes hands and tells people to, quote, look after my family. He goes to dinners with foreign oligarchs and a Ukrainian executive paying his son millions of dollars. He gets paid with money from Chinese businessmen who he has meetings with and tells other business associates he'll see what he can do to help their situations. He writes letters of recommendation for foreign business associates' children. The scam is simple. The Biden family promises they can make a foreign partner's problems go away by engaging the U.S. government. The problems can be anything. A Ukrainian corruption investigation, moving Russian money to the United States, a Romanian criminal prosecution, access for China to American energy sources. Joe shows up, shakes a few hands in front of his son, and says, quote, take care of my boy, or something similar. And the money flows to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. It's done over and over again. The Biden family promises Joe's power. Joe Biden shows up, and millions of dollars come into the Biden's pockets. Joe Biden is the family's closer. How could he not be? The Bidens aren't doing any other work for these foreign companies that would warrant tens of millions of dollars. There are only two explanations for this. The first is that Joe Biden knows exactly what he's doing and knows a handshake, a wink, and a smile is enough for him to maintain, as Jim Biden famously calls it, plausible deniability. Or Joe Biden is being led around by his family and has no idea who he's meeting with or what message he is sending and is truly an elderly man with a poor memory. There's no other explanation. Either Joe Biden is complicit or Joe Biden is incompetent. Since becoming chairman of this committee in January 2023, I've promised the investigation into the Biden family's influence peddling would be based on bank records, witness terror testimony, and verifiable facts. After years of Democrats using this committee as a mouthpiece for every conspiracy theory they could find, like the Russian collusion hoax, under my leadership, the committee has returned to real investigations. If Democrats want to spend another Russian hoax, I will ask them to answer one question. What services did the Bidens provide to earn them and their business associates over $24 million? What did they do for the money? Democrats have the same bank records as we do, and bank records do not lie. The witnesses today are here to talk about Joe Biden. Republicans are here to talk about Joe Biden. If Democrats wish to spend their time beclowning themselves with another Russian collusion hoax for the sake of protecting President Biden, they can do so. 
As I said, I would have invited Hunter Biden here today to sit alongside his business associates and provide his side of the story. Hunter, Hunter Biden demanded a public hearing. I've given him one. Maybe he will show up. He has said he isn't, but he loves saying one thing and doing another. At some point, Hunter Biden saying one thing and doing another begins to re reflect poorly on his ability to tell the truth at all. But this hearing is not about Hunter Biden. This investigation is not about Hunter Biden. It's about Joe Biden and the lies he continues to tell the American people. With that, I yield to <coughs> Ranking Member Smith, or Chairman Smith. Thank you, Chairman Comer and Ranking Member Raskin. From the beginning of this investigation, we've made clear that we will follow the facts wherever they lead. The facts have led us to two conclusions. One, the Biden family has for years traded on Joe Biden's name in order to rake in millions of dollars, often doing so with his direct knowledge and clear involvement. Two, President Biden has been continually dishonest with the American people about his knowledge of his family's business dealings. We have testimony from multiple witnesses that Joe Biden was the brand. He knew what his son and brother were doing and did nothing to stop it. That alone makes him complicit in a scheme to make money off of his public service. But he was not just complicit. He was, as one of today's witnesses has testified, an enabler of this activity. The evidence of the two IRS whistleblowers who came to the Ways and Means Committee has been affirmed by volumes of material provided to Congress by the testimony of others and even by the Department of Justice who finally brought charges against Hunter Biden that mirror those called for by the IRS investigators. The evidence obtained shows that one, Joe Biden met with his son's business partners on multiple occasions. He used an alias to exchange dozens of emails with his son's bookkeeper. He took official government action that suspiciously coincided with those meetings and correspondence. The connections between Joe Biden and his son's business practices extended even to the Biden 2020 campaign. At the height of the Democrat primary, Kevin Morris, a Hollywood lawyer who met Hunter Biden at a Joe Biden campaign fundraiser, paid off. Hunter Biden's tax liabilities because there was, in his words, quote, risk personally and politically. If that matter was not swept under the rug, investigators that were interested in pursuing a potential criminal campaign violation were told to stand down. The Biden family relied on the Biden brand so much that evidence has revealed that Hunter Biden believed that, quote, all this stuff meaning his legal troubles would all go away when his dad became president. Why did he believe that? Because for years, the Biden family has personally benefited from Joe Biden's position of power. Joe Biden knew this, he did nothing to stop it, and he lied about it. I yield to Jim Jordan, Chairman Jordan. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Who planted the pipe bombs on January 6th? Nobody seems to know. Who leaked the Dobbs draft opinion? You know, the leak that led to an assassination attempt on Justice Kavanaugh. How about this one? Who left cocaine at the White House? Biden administration doesn't seem to have time to answer these questions. They're too busy investigating parents at school board meetings, labeling Catholics extremists, retaliating against whistleblowers. They're too busy putting together a sweetheart deal for Hunter Biden, a deal that got laughed out of court. And oh, the guy who put together the deal that got laughed out of court, that's the guy they name special counsel. You know what Democrats do have time for? Going after President Trump. They've been doing it for eight years. They spied on his campaign. Then it was the Mueller investigation, 19 lawyers, 40 agents, $30 million, and found nothing. Then it was impeachment. Then it was raid his home. Then it was a special counsel. Then it was the 14th Amendment. The party of democracy said, we're going to keep the guy off the ballot who's leading in every single poll. The ranking member said that President Trump should be disqualified from even running for office. Thank goodness we have a Supreme Court who disagreed with the ranking member and the Democrats. Nine to zero. Not five, four, not six, three, not seven, two, not eight, one, nine to zero. They disagreed. Now Democrats say, how dare 
How dare Republicans investigate Joe Biden? How dare they look into the money, the business, and the brand? Millions of dollars, as the chairman said, millions of dollars from foreign entities run through 20 different companies for what? Wasn't, I mean, 20 different companies for what? Devin Archer told us what it was for. Access to the brand. And the brand was Joe Biden. The brand that played rounds of golf, took calls and meetings, attended lunches and dinners with Hunter Biden and his business partners. The brand that said, the brand that conditioned $1, million, $1 billion of American tax money on the firing of the prosecutor pressuring the company Hunter Biden sat on the board of. And oh, by the way, was getting paid a million bucks a year. Today, we're gonna learn more about that brand. We're gonna learn more about what Mr. Galanis called the Biden lift. We'll learn about the plausible deniability that Jim Biden talked to Mr. Bobolinsky about, and we'll hear about the statement, the rule that governed how the business operated around Joe Biden, the rule that said, say it, forget it, write it, regret it. So I want to thank our witnesses for coming here today. They, like the whistleblowers who came to the Ways and Means Committee, are doing it simply because they want the American people to have the truth. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member for 12 minutes for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you very kindly. Um, with any luck, today marks the end of perhaps the most spectacular failure in the history of congressional investigations, the effort to find a high crime or misdemeanor committed by Joe Biden and then to impeach him for it. In prior hilarious episodes of this long-running madcap series, America got to see the following. One, nearly 20 fact witnesses who could not identify a single act of wrongdoing by President Biden, much less a high crime and misdemeanor, and who overwhelmingly testified that Biden was not involved in any of his family's business adventures. Two, three expert witnesses called by the majority itself who said nothing that they had seen in the tens of thousands of pages of documents uh, adduced by the majority, even remotely approach the level of a high crime and misdemeanor. Bank records would show exactly what all the witnesses told us, that Joe Biden was not involved in his family members' businesses. Repeated voyeuristic displays of pornographic images by the majority completely irrelevant to any conceivable legislative or investigative purpose. A star witness, Gal Luft, who turned out to be a Chinese agent and an illegal arms trafficker on the run from American justice. And the key piece of evidence, which launched the entire zany goose chase, an FD-1023 form in which the FBI duly recorded a completely fictional tip about a $5 million bribe to Vice President Biden peddled by Alex Smirnoff, who has been criminally indicted by a Trump-appointed U.S. attorney, Special Counsel David Weiss, for felony counts of systematically lying to the FBI in constructing a false record about Joe Biden and now sits in jail in California as a flight risk while the world studies his longstanding and extensive ties to Russian intelligence. Today, the good chairman and his ace mega detectives have finally jumped the shark. The comedy of errors comes crashing to an end as House Republicans in more than a dozen Biden districts beg for mercy and the committee throws a flabby Hail Mary pass three weeks after the Super Bowl's over. So today we revisit the fruitless testimony of two more fading star witnesses who have failed to testify to any presidential wrongdoing, much less evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. Both of the majority witnesses are frustrated would-be business partners of Hunter Biden, who tried to leverage the Biden name, or the Biden brand, as they keep calling it. But they never got any business off the ground for reasons that will become painfully obvious to anyone watching the proceedings today. Even Hunter Biden, laboring at the time under a serious substance abuse addiction, could tell these were not the type of people he should be doing business with. So rather than representing the Biden brand, which was their ardent wish, they now show up today as loyal servants of Trump world, each of them proudly represented by their very own former Trump White House attorney. The first, 
is Mr. Bobolinsky, the bitterly disappointed wannabe hunter business partner whose famously litigious history includes unsuccessfully suing his own dying father's charity for nearly a million dollars, and just last month suing Cassidy Hutchinson for $10 million after she reported that Mr. Bobolinsky wearing a ski mask met with Mark Meadows, which Ms. Hutchison is now backed up with actual documentary photographic evidence, something in very short supply in this investigation. Mr. Bobolinsky made his hazy allegations against the Bidens public for the first time at a press conference choreographed by the Trump for President campaign, which provided him a venue, a gaggle of journalists, and even a dress shirt that they went out and bought for him uh, to wear to the event. Hours later, Mr. Bobolinsky joined the second 2020 presidential debate as Donald Trump's personal guest, where he was seated with Kid Rock and Mark Meadows. The other star witness, Mr. Galanis, who I believe is appearing by Zoom today, is a serial fraudster and convicted con man, a term I would charitably not use on a witness, except it was explicitly bestowed upon him by not one, but two different U.S. federal district court judges, including the one who sentenced him to over 15 years in prison for defrauding union pension funds, a Native American tribe, and scores of innocent investors. Mr. Galanis was sentenced to pay restitution of over $80 million to his victims. That's a lot of money. That's what Donald Trump was sentenced to pay uh, E. Jean Carroll for in that civil litigation. The very first record of Mr. Galanis's claims against the Biden family appeared, check this out, in the clemency petition that he sent from prison to President Trump. Um, but the key point is this. Even if we were to believe every single word offered by these utterly compromised and biased witnesses, Mr. Bobolinsky and Mr. Galanis, their allegations don't identify any wrongdoing much less an impeachable offense by President Biden. With the impeachment bus running on empty, our GEO colleagues now are apparently preparing to save face by ending the impeachment farce with criminal referrals. But criminal referrals require evidence of crimes. And the only crimes we have seen are those of the GOP's own star witnesses, like Russian asset Alex Smirnoff, Chinese agent Gal Luft, Devin Archer, and Jason Galanis. The minority witness today, our witness, Lev Parnas, casts a piercing light on what's really taking place here. And Mr. Parnas has reason to know. He too used to be a mega sycophant peddling lies and disinformation to smear Joe Biden. Today, he joins a long line of self-exiles from Trump world who could no longer stomach all the corruption and deceit. People like Cassidy Hutchinson, people like Michael Cohen, Sarah Matthews, Alyssa Griffin, General James Mattis, Mattis, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, General John Kelly, and now Vice President Mike Pence, who refuses to endorse for president the man he served with. But... We do have loyal sycophants still in the room, and one day I look forward to hearing their testimony about how they got sunk into this religious cult. Mr. Parnas wrote Chairman Comer and me a remarkable letter on July 23rd, 2023. This is the first time I'm meeting him today. He was Rudy Giuliani's right-hand man, his globetrotting business partner, and language interpreter in the mission to manufacture Ukraine and Burisma-related dirt and smears against Joe Biden in 2018 and 2019. He spent all of his time traveling around the world trying to stage uh, evidence against Joe Biden. In his letter, Parnas explains that the desperate search to find evidence of any kind of Biden corruption was a complete and total bust because there was no evidence to find. He wrote to tell us that not only is there no evidence in Ukraine that Joe Biden did anything improper, but more darkly, the manic search for a smoking gun against Biden became a mission to invent and concoct evidence out of thin air with the active help of Russian intelligence assets and agents. 
A man, I'm getting to Russia. You haven't heard anything yet, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a man who has reckoned with his own moral descent into Trump world, Lev Parnas is ashamed of what he did to serve the interests of Russian propaganda and Putin's lies. And he wants America to know the truth. He can explain how the Russian stimulated conspiracy theories and lies that he promoted with Rudy Giuliani live on in the tiresome fabrication spread by Alex Smirnoff and now repeated by this committee like Pavlov's dog. At every turn, my colleagues cry Russia hoax, even in the face of repeated warnings from Donald Trump's own Treasury Secretary and Secretary of State from the intelligence community, from Robert Mueller, and most recently from special counsel Weiss, who was named to office by Donald Trump. As Secretary Mnuchin stated, quote, Russian disinformation campaigns targeting American citizens are a threat to our democracy. That's Secretary Mnuchin, someone that you guys usually defend, but my GOP colleagues continue to cry Russia hoax like cult members selling flowers at the airport. Our colleagues are the ones loyally amplifying the actual Russian hoax. Not the Russia hoax, the Russian hoax. The one that Giuliani and Trump and Smirnoff have eagerly, eagerly adopted from Putin and his agents. They participate in this hoax while they shamefully block $60 billion in military assistance to President Zelensky and the besieged Ukrainian people five years after Trump and Giuliani tried to shake President Zelensky down for counterfeit dirt on Joe Biden. And while they continue to parrot these transparent Russian lies, Vladimir Putin wages his bloody aggressive war on Ukraine filled with atrocities like the mass kidnapping of children and the rape and slaughter of civilians. The MAGA rights wholesale adoption of this Russian hoax and their sellout of the Ukrainian people by the mega right is an historic betrayal of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. But the defense of democracy begins with fidelity to the truth and the oversight Democrats, America's truth squad against this disinformation is here today to set the record straight. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. I would now like to introduce our witnesses. Mr. Tony Bobulinski. Mr. Bobulinski was a business partner of Hunter Biden in a joint venture between a Chinese energy entity, CEFC. Mr. Bobulinski sat for a transcribed interview with the committee on February 13, 2024. Mr. Lev Parnas. Mr. Parnas uh, was not a business associate of the Biden family. Uh, Mr. Parnas is an entrepreneur, a political activist, and an author. And Mr. Jason Galanis. Mr. Galanis was a business partner of Hunter Biden. Mr. Galanis sat for a transcribed interview with this committee on February 23, 2024. We asked the Bureau of Prisons to make him available in person today. They would only provide Mr. Galanis for virtual testimony. Notably, Mr. Galanis applied for CARES Act home confinement and after a lengthy approval process was approved for home confinement on June 9th, 2023. On June 12, 2023, I issued a subpoena to Devin Archer for testimony. On the following day, June 13, 2023, Mr. Galanis' approval was reversed as a result of Department of Justice's intervention. So Mr. Galanis has remained in a federal prison facility. He is currently in Montgomery, Alabama. Mr. Galanis, can you please state for the record who else is in the room with you? Uh, yes, Chairman Coleman. Uh, uh, my counsel and uh, advisor, uh, uh, Mark uh, Paletta uh, and Nicholas Wise. Thank you. Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise the right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? 